Good morning. Actually, good afternoon. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. We have been joined by Council Members Powers, Yeager, and Kalos. Today we are having a first hearing on legislation by Council Member Bain Kalos proposed introduction 732A of 2018 relating to establishing a full public match campaign finance system. Since 1988, New York City's Campaign Finance Act, administered by the Campaign Finance Board, has provided candidates who, who choose to participate in the city's public financing program with funds to help finance their campaigns. In exchange for limits on expenditures and other requirements, eligible portions of matchable contributions to participating candidates are matched at eight for every dollar contributed by a New York City resident. The intent of the public financing program is to prevent corruption, to enhance public confidence in local government by reducing improper influence on big dollar campaign contributions and to increase engagement with local communities by encouraging candidates to raise small dollar contributions from average New Yorkers. Data from the CFB 2017 post-election report strongly indicates that the public financing program has successfully incentivized reliance on small donations. The vast majority of candidates in 2017 cycle participated in the program, 84% in the primary and 64% in the general, and the percentage of contributions under $175 increased to 73%, up from 62% in the 2013. Proposed introduction 732A of 2018 will amend the Campaign Finance Act, current cap on matching funds available to candidates participating in the public financing program. Specifically, it will allow, <coughs> excuse me, it will allow candidates to receive matching funds in an amount such that a candidate could reach the expenditure limit solely through a combination of matchable contributions and public funds. With the current eight to one match, this will functionally be a public funds cap of 88.89% on the expenditure limit. The new full public funds cap will be available to participating candidates who select the options for new contribution limits and fundraising thresholds in the 2021 primary and general elections. Participating candidates who do not select this option will continue to have the existing public funds cap of 55% of the expenditure limit apply through 2021. Starting in 2022, the public, the full public match cap will apply to all participating candidates. The bill will make several other amendments. It will increase the number of the dates on which CFB will disperse public funds, will conform such dates to New York State new June primary date and will require a first payment on December 15 preceding the election year. The bill moves the deadline by which candidates wishing to participate in the public financing program must file a certification with the CFB from the 10th day of June to the 9th Monday preceding the primary election. This will also be the last day by which candidates could resend a prior certification so long as they have not accepted their public funds. The bill will move to the administrative code provisions added to the charter by the November 2018 ballot proposal, question number one, and by local law one of 2019. In addition to increasing the public match to eight to one, those provisions lower contribution limits, increase the individual donor amounts citywide candidates can use to qualify for receipt of public funds, have the qualifying the threshold dollars amount for special elections to fill a vacancy for citywide offices. The bill will permit participating candidates to use public funds to cost for costs related to defending a challenge to the validity of candidates' petition to get on the ballot. 
The bill will also adjust the contribution limits for transition and inauguration entities to match for the non-participating candidates under the contribution limits to be in effect in 2022. Finally, the bill will also remove portions of the Campaign Finance Act that have expired or been rendered unenforceable. I will also, I would like to thank our staff whose work made this hearing possible, Brad Reed, Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjom, Zach Harris, uh, Charlotte Martin, as well as my own legislative director, Claire Mike Levin. I will now ask the sponsor of the bill to speak on this legislation, Council Member Kalos. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. Uh, I'm hoping that folks who are uh, watching at home will uh, participate in this hearing. Uh, you can tweet me, uh, Instagram me, Facebook me, at Ben Kalos. Uh, and please use the uh, hashtag big money out. I want to start by thanking uh, Chair Fernando Cabrera. We've known each other now for uh, five and a half years. When I first started working on this legislation back when I first got elected, he was my co-prime for introduction 1130 of 2016. And uh, he remains a co-prime of introduction 732A. Perhaps it was foreshadowing. But the truth is that this, the chair of this committee, uh, Fernando Cabrera, has been a long proponent of anything that can improve the democratic process and open uh, the, the campaigns to more people and participation by more people. So I really, really thank you, thank you. from the bottom of my heart. Uh, this legislation now has 33 council members sponsoring it, and uh, we had a 34th, uh, which was uh, who, who has since become public advocates, so we're back down to 33, and I really appreciate the fact that the council has honored the uh, 34 members, triggers a hearing uh, rule. Uh, incidentally, last term, we had more than 34 sponsors. Uh, we were able to force a hearing, uh, and despite having a super, a veto-proof majority and a, a chairman who was interested in voting it out of committee, somehow we did not have the support uh, to vote the legislation out of committee. Uh, I want to thank the chair who's gone into a lot of the details of this, but uh, th there are folks in this room who can likely testify to the fact that this has been something I've been looking to do going back to at least 10 years, to at least 2008. <laughs> Uh, and uh, my concern has always just been that there's a lot of big money in politics. And uh, my goal, my, my feeling was that all too often you look at government and feel like it's not doing what you want it to. And when that happens, you often look to things that might be having a corrupting influence. And uh, that is a small, s uh, and so along, and when I say corrupting, that's small c corruption in the sense that Lawrence, Professor Lawrence Lessig would apply, of it, it's not doing exactly what it should. The rules aren't really being followed the way you thought. And um, in no small part, elected officials running for citywide office can take contributions of $5,100. And regardless of whether you're getting a fair shake, when you see an elected official who's taking $5,100 with somebody you disagree with and you can't afford $5,100, it feels inequitable. It creates, at best, an appearance of propriety. And if you read the New York Post, I want to thank the New York Post, Politico, and Gotham Gazette, but Gotham Gazette in particular, uh, for being here today. But if you've been reading the New York Post, they've been asking questions about uh, real estate deals where uh, the developers have been getting uh, uh, paid $30 million more than the appraised value. And uh, when you see campaign contributions along with that, that can raise a lot of questions. Uh, so campaign finance, a lot of folks would say that it's not the uh, most interesting issue, but I would actually disagree with them. And I think that 1.1 million New Yorkers would agree with me as well. By To put that in reference, that is more people who voted in favor of campaign finance reform in November than voted for mayor, uh, voted for all candidates for mayor in 2017. So it is a big issue. And uh, we, we had to get it done that way because we couldn't get it through the council at the time, or at least at that council. I am so grateful to be part of this council with our speaker, Corey Johnson, during the speaker's race. He said he supported this legislation, and 
he's put his money where his mouth is, uh, in that he's continuing to support it, and, and that's a uh, big deal. Uh, following the great turnout, we applied this, uh, what was on the ballot, not even this, which is a little bit more aggressive, as Local Law 1 of 2019, uh, which I had the privilege of authoring, and uh, the, the results are in. It, campaign finance worked. We have flipped how elections are financed upside down. An analysis that was published in Gotham Gazette showed that these changes resulted in an election powered by small contributions for citywide office the first time ever, and as of the last and final filing in March, 61% of the contributions were small dollars, nearly more than doubling the 26% of small dollars in 2013. Uh, now, introduction 732 would just go a little bit further, so we're at 75%, and that means about 75% of the small dollars get matched, but at a certain point, it stops getting matched, and when that happens, if you're running for citywide, that's a uh, $1.8 million that won't be matched, and uh, that is quite a lot of money. Under this system, it would change that to about $800,000. Uh, the previous match was 55%. The current match under option B is 75%. This sets a ratio uh, between uh, the 8 to 1. So at the 8 to 1 match, it actually changes it to an 88.88 repeating, uh, which we'll call 89%. Uh, this will apply, uh, be available until 2021 as an option when it will become an option in 2022. Uh, the chair went into a lot of the summary, but uh, it will also codify what was in the charter. Because right now, if you read the charter, it says one thing, and the administrative code, it says another. Uh, while the charter is free to over, uh, overrule the administrative code, it is best for it to be together. And I, I will just say that I have... I have always wanted to get to rewrite the campaign finance system and get to run under that system, uh, which I intend to do. Uh, I think this is a game changer. We've already seen the changes. Uh, in 2013, I didn't take, I, I refused real estate money. I've never taken corporate money. I uh, have refused corporate PAC money. And when I did it, it was weird. No one else was doing it. I got mocked for it openly, and I know behind my back, because folks have told me. Uh, and now it's kind of the thing to do, and I think it's the thing to do because it's being empowered by a campaign finance system that works. Uh, I want to do a couple of thank yous. Uh, biggest thank you to uh, Robert Newman, uh, Brad Reed, who is now the head of the infrastructure division and, and no longer really gets to work with the governmental operations committee, uh, Elizabeth Cronk, our committee analyst, uh, Zach Harris, who we will uh, miss, and uh, we this will be his his last hearing. But uh, we hope you Wednesday, Wednesday will be his this will be his second to last hearing, uh, and Daniel Collins. And then I also want to thank because of how long we've been working on it, uh, Matt Gualb, uh, who worked on this legislation, the council worked on this as the uh, executive director of the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission and David Seitzer, who worked on this as the first committee counsel on this committee, uh, who is now working on the Council's Charter Revision Commission. I'm sorry for such a long statement. It's just something I've been working on for a decade of my life, and uh, I hope we can get it done. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Kalos, and uh, we were proud of you. We're proud of this work. Um, I have to tell you, I was gonna call it a sign no, but it's an important no. Uh, in districts like myself, uh, which I represent, which is very, very difficult uh, to raise money, uh, funds for campaigns. This is a game changer that puts everyone in an equal, uh, equal floor. Uh, and it, this is gonna incentivize people to run for office. We wanna see more people running. And you got ahead of me with Zach Harris, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll wait until the very last one for the big thunder. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get started here. We're gonna ask Rini Fonseca Sabine, uh, Democracy NYC, uh, Mayor's Office. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. And I'll just need to spray Oh, yeah. Do you? 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And if you can introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and uh, council members of the Committee on Government Operations. Um, my name is Irene Fonseca Sabuni. I'm the Chief Democracy Officer for the City of New York. First, I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify before you today. Um, I'd like to give you a brief overview of Democracy NYC and then discuss our view on public financing. Uh, the Democracy NYC initiative is aimed at increasing voter registration, voter participation, and civic engagement in New York City. It was first announced in 2018 by Mayor de Blasio uh, as part of a robust 10-point plan uh, to make it easier to participate in elections in New York City. In fact, the first point of that plan was taking big money out of politics, underscoring the importance of this issue for the administration. Another initiative of our program is engaging young people in voting. And last week, working with partners across government and nonprofit sectors, we coordinated a student voter registration drive, including hundreds of, of schools all around New York City. Since I began in the role of Chief Democracy Officer, I've heard from New Yorkers from every walk of life. New Yorkers young and old, rich and poor, high schools, community centers, faith communities, through these conversations, I've learned a great deal about how the public feels about our democratic process, and what I've learned has been concerning. Many people are cynical, many don't believe elections are fair, and some believe that they are not valued by elected officials as, mu as much as those who can make large contributions. Democracy NYC was founded by the mayor with the guiding principle of increasing public engagement in the democratic process. In order to accomplish this goal, we must first build trust between the people of New York City and our electoral system. Establishing this trust begins with rooting out corruption and even the appearance of corruption by getting big money out of politics. As I mentioned earlier, this issue is so critical that it was the first point of our 10-point plan. Indeed, um, as has been discussed, the Charter Revision Commission um, that the mayor constituted last year proposed a plan to deepen public financing of local elections with the goal of elections being primarily funded by public dollars. Um, this proposal grew out of the idea that the way to address persistent cynical perceptions of politics was to significantly lower contribution limits for all candidates and increase public matching funds. These changes were overwhelmingly adopted, as uh, Councilmember Kalos noted, by the voters in uh, November of last year, and uh, more than 80% voted in favor. Um, as you know, uh, included in those changes was an increase to the matching ratio from 6 to 1 to 8 to 1, and an increase in the total amount of public matching funds available from 55% to 75%. New York City has been a leader in the country in robust campaign finance re reform and with our public financing system. Since adoption of the new system um, and uh, its incorporation into the special election, um, early feedback has been positive. In the special election for public advocate, the majority of the candidates opted in and the most con common contribution was just $10. I'd like to re reiterate how impactful it is in a citywide election to have $10 as the most common contribution. In the prior public advocate race, the most common contribution had been $100. In a world of super PACs and dark money influencing elections, in this city, we have worked to make our elections accessible to all New Yorkers. This administration believes strongly in matching funds so that smaller donations can have a greater impact for all candidates. Democracy NYC aims to restore public faith in our democratic process. As a result of this commitment, we are supportive of initiatives to strengthen campaign finance reform and reduce the potentially corrupting influence of large donations in our elections. We share the values guiding uh, intro to 732A and look forward to further discussions on this legislation, its potential to impact our city, and ways we can work together with stakeholders to continue to improve New York City's public financing system. Um, thank you again for hearing from me today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Let me recognize we've been joined by Council Member Mysell. Let me turn it over to the sponsor of the bill. Thank you uh, very much for all of your work, and uh, thank you for having me for uh, Student Voter Registration Day. Uh, the high school students were 
very impressive and uh, definitely gave me uh, a run for my money. Um, it was great I to have you there, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, and, and just thank you for taking on this issue of democracy and trying to improve it. Uh, can you tell me a little bit, and, and I don't know if I made it strong enough, but we would I don't think we would be here if the mayor hadn't called the Charter Revision Commission on democracy and if the members of that commission uh, hadn't already gotten us to 75% and had we not been able to show that it worked. So I also thank the mayor for signing local law uh, one. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about um, any involvement you had in the charter revision and the mayor's charter revision process and what, how, how we got to that 75% as well as uh, any additional impact even anecdotally from the public advocates race and whether more people that you ran into participated? Sure. Um, I began in this role in October, on October 1st of 2018, so much of the work um, and the credit goes to the Charter Revision Commission um, staff who worked tirelessly to um, pass that um, uh, charter amendments. Um, I will say that in going all around the city and in my uh, reaching out to young people in particular, um, people are um, cynical uh, about the role that uh, someone can play in in the electoral process if they don't have deep pockets. And uh, hearing from um, individuals, you know, from high schools all the way up to senior centers, those are two of my, uh, the, the, the places where I go to talk to people. And um, across the board, um, people are interested in, in making sure that smaller donations can matter. Um, and so I think, um, you know, taking that opportunity to build trust um, in the electoral system um, I've heard from people anecdotally that d that does make a difference. Okay, any other questions? Council Mayor Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't see in your testimony uh, that the administration supports this bill. I didn't see you say that you oppose it either. That's correct. So you neither support nor oppose it. We um, fully support um, a robust public financing system. Um, it's very important to the administration um, as evidenced by the uh, Charter Revision Commission and the um, following the, the lead of the voters, 80% of whom supported um, the uh, increase to the public match. Um, with respect to these specifics, we look forward to hearing from um, others who will be testifying today, including the CFB, as well as advocates from the community, um, and would look forward to sitting down with you and your staff to uh, get into the details more and the impact of this bill. Well, not me, it's not my bill, but uh, I meant Ca generally. Councilman Kalos wants this bill, uh, given his druthers, I believe he'd have a vote on it tomorrow to be on the state in a couple of days. So that's not gonna happen, but if that happened, are you saying the mayor won't sign it? We will sit down tonight okay. if we need to. Gotcha, all right. Yes. Let me ask you a different question. Um, the proposal is 75% uh, of the cap. Um, we already 80, have 79 percent yes. of the cap. Excuse me. Seventy-five percent is the is the charter revision that, yes. we, that the voters wisely or not wisely adopted, um, and we're coming in six months later and saying we have a better idea that the, than the voters had six months ago. But uh, if we're at eighty-nine percent, why is eighty-nine percent the right number? Why not a hundred percent? Why not anybody who wants to run for city council or any office, mayor, just you know go down to say your office and fill out a form, show a driver's license, say I live in New York, I'd like to run for mayor, you write them a check for a couple million dollars and call it a day. <laughs> Why should anybody raise any money? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say that um, with respect to the administration of the uh, public financing system, uh, the campaign finance board does administer the system and will be here to speak to that. Um, with respect to the exact uh, percentage that's right, um, I think that's exactly why we would want to sit down um, with the council, uh, council member Kalos, and, um, and and dig into this as well as with the relevant stakeholders. I, I'm going to let uh, council member Kalos. There's a re particular reason why it's 89 percent. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so th this is a, a little unorthodox, but uh, <laughs> fair fair enough. So the reason it's at 89 percent is that uh, the person a, a candidate would raise 11 percent and then 
they would get 89% and that would actually be a full public match. If a person raised more than that, they would end up paying back that money to the city to help pay for the process and that would go back to the fund. If it went up to a one to 10 uh, match from the eight to one, then that number would go up from 89%. Uh, so that is how we came to the 89% number. But if the goal is getting private money out of out of campaigns and not having candidates solicit funds uh, to run their campaigns, why not just have a form, people fill it out, say, hey, here I am, I'm ready to run for something, give me my check. Why ask them to raise any money? We have a, a public matching system in New York City. I, I am a fan of clean money, clean elections, uh, which actually does, a person goes out and they ask 50 people for $10, which is a very de minimis contribution, and then they get the rest. But given the current system that we're working with, I think this is a step in the right direction. So the goal ultimately is to just have people come in and fill out a form and not have to raise anything? I, I, I would say clean money, clean elections, which is a l little bit more work than that. Uh, but we want, we want to have a robust democracy with uh, people able to run and not barred because of money. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, now we'll have CFP. You can both raise your hands to be sworn in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes. Okay. And you can begin if you could introduce yourselves. Great. Right. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Amy Loprest. I'm the Executive Director of the campaign New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me is the Board Chair, Frederick Schaefer. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on intro 732A, sponsored by Council Member Ben Kalos, which would raise the cap on public funds available to candidates, incorporate the language of the last year's ballot questions into the Campaign Finance Act, and make changes to conform to the June primary date, including making public funds payments available to candidates as early as the December prior to an election year. The CFB is supportive of the goals of this legislation, which are to encourage small dollar fundraising and reduce the risk of corruption associated with large contributions to candidates for city office. After reviewing the administration and impact of the program during, the during 2017, we reported that the program has worked differently for citywide candidates than it has for city council candidates. In prior elections, candidates for mayor have been considerably more reliant on large contributors than candidates for council seats. To address this disparity, we made a series of recommendations aimed at reducing the amount of large private contributions in city elections by lowering the contribution limit, increasing the incentives for small dollar fundraising by increasing the matching formula, and enabling candidates to rely more heavily on public matching funds by increasing the public funds cap. As you know, the 2018 Charter Revision Commission looked at these issues closely. After the deliberations, the, pro the proposal that last year's commission put before the voters increased the matching formula to eight to one and boosted the amount of public funds available to candidates from 55% of the spending limit to 75%. Additionally, the proposal made funds available starting in February of the election year to candidates who could demonstrate that they faced a serious opponent. Voters went on to overwhelmingly support the measure with over 80% voting yes. New Yorkers made it clear they want publicly financed elections to continue playing a role in their democracy. Under the new system, we are already seeing changes in fundraising at the citywide level. Local Law 1 of 2019, also sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, put the parameters approved by the voters into effect for February's special election for public advocate. Early data from that special election shows that this new iteration of the program is working as intended. The most frequent contribution size, as was mentioned before, across all candidates was just $10 compared to $100 in previous election cycles. A strong public matching funds program for city elections helps New Yorkers elect a government that is more inclusive, representative, and responsive. 
The CFB looks forward to working with the council to ensure that the public matching funds program continues to play a significant role in our elections. While the CFB shares the broad goals of intro number 732A, we have some practical concerns with the bill as drafted, and we'd like to highlight some of the potential risks that we hope to work with the council to mitigate. The CFB originally proposed making early payments to candidates before the final ballot determinations in our 2013 post-election report. Making payments earlier and more frequently in the election cycle mitigates the stress of waiting until just five weeks before the election to receive a first public funds payment. An earlier payment schedule also gives candidates more time to address any compliance issues that could prevent them from receiving public funds. That said, the risk associated with candidates who do not face serious opposition or who do not end up running serious campaigns increases when payments are, made, are available so early in the election cycle. The board takes this risk ser seriously as an increase in the amount of such payments could undermine public support for the program. Local Law 168 of 2016, also sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, addressed this risk by setting a cap on payments made before final determinations on the ballot. The 2018 Charter Revision, Charter Revision Commission sought to address this increased risk by prohibiting any early payments to candidates who could not submit a valid certified statement of need to demonstrate that they were opposed by a candidate who met one of, one of the criteria laid out in Section 3-705 of the Campaign Finance Act. The submission of a valid cer certified statement of need capped any payment to 25% of the maximum amount. However, intro number 732A removes this prohibition, which we believe the bill should find a way to address. To protect taxpayer dollars from misuse, the act sets clear standards for how campaign may spend their public matching funds. Another serious risk is that candidates rely heavily on public funds and may be, may be unable to show that their funds were used for, quote, qualified expenditures and will have to return their funds once the election is over. We raised these concerns in April 2017 when this committee heard an earlier version of this legislation. As you know, to be able to use public funds for an expenditure, the campaign must show that an expenditure was in furtherance of the campaign, made in the year of the election, reported in a timely fashion to the CFB, and fully documented. Increasing the amount of available public funds will also limit candidates' ability to spend campaign funds on non-qualified expenditures, including cash expenditures, payments to family members, spending related to the holding of public office, and post-election spending. For 30 years, the program has helped keep big money out of politics and provided public matching funds that engage and empower more New Yorkers to make their voice heard in city elections. The program remains strong because of our work with this council over the years to ensure that it evolves to meet the cha challenges of an evolving political landscape. We look forward to working with the council to address the issues we've raised today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much and I first want to take a moment to thank you for all the work that you did uh, in preparation for the charter revision, all the recommendations that you made that, uh, that made campaign finance uh, a better program and which uh, previously I have personally benefited from, uh, you know, now being here in the council. Uh, I have one question, then I'm going to turn it over uh, to my colleagues. Um, and it's in respect to if a candidate were to choose option A for, 20, for the 2021 primary, uh, which match ratio and contribution limits, which, which match ratio and contribution limits do you believe should apply to contributions received prior to January 20, uh, January 12th? Uh, 2019. So, for example, if a particular candidate had raised money uh, prior uh, to January 12, now they would be forced to return that money and ask for a check or a contribution, however they receive contributions. So it's like double work for you guys, double work for the candidate. I, I just don't think it makes any sense. I'm just wondering where you stand. So to, to, uh, <laughs> to clar clarify, so the law that was passed by the Charter Revision Commission and adopted by the voters and also this law wouldn't make any change to the fact that the new program, the option A, starts only on January 1st, 2019. And so candidates, uh, to, in order to get the full eight to one match, 
uh, any contributions that were raised for that and were claimed for matching funds, a candidate would have to return those that contribution and then get the get a new contribution, you know, presumably get a new contribution from the same contributor, and then that contribution would be el eligible for the full uh, hunt, uh, eight to one match. Um, I think that uh, because in, in previous election cycles when the matching rate went from first from one to one to four to one to six to one, um, that match was retroactive to the whole entire election cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think that that makes a lot of sense in order to uh, avoid this kind of administrative work for the candidates and the Kevin Connors board. Thank you for that, that's, that's huge. Uh, looking forward to speaking with the sponsor of the bill to see if we could work in uh, adding that on. Uh, I'm going to turn it now over because I know you have some questions regarding some of the uh, issues that you brought up during your testimony. Uh, so I just want to uh, echo the, the chair, and that was also going to be my first question, which is uh, our, our current draft uh, does not have it, is not retroactive, which is, was a, uh, sorry, let me start with one important piece just for the sake of transparency. At the hearing on what would ultimately become Local Law 1, there was vigorous debate between myself and another member, which I appreciate. Democracy is good when that happens. And during that debate, there was a lot of questions about was there a way to make it better. This is a, again, we're hoping to make it better. And so uh, working with this, um, in the current draft that we have of the legislation, our A version, uh, it, it does not have it retroactive. Uh, what was voted on did not have it uh, become retroactive. Local law one did have it be retroactive. Is there a, a reason in terms of equity why a, what a candidate who's been accepting contributions for $5,100 uh, who then can keep the $5,100 and then opt into a newer threshold of $2,000 uh, does that is that fair, or should we just have a simplified? If you're opting into an option B, whether it is uh, this or an improved option B, that for the sake of equity, it should be a uh, retroactive application. Um, so I, I, I mean, I can see the principle of equity there. Um, I, you, one way to address that could be to make the contribution limits retroactive to the beginning of the election cycle, also, um, but. The, you know, the option A, if you choose option A, make it retroactive. It's very confusing, option A and option B. <laughs> You're correct, I'm sorry. So, so let the record uh, reflect me, reflect <laughs> I meant option A. Okay. So, um, but I, I still think that uh, because of the value and the, the values espoused by the higher matching rate and the lower contribution limit, that it would, you, you still, there would be a, valid reason to make the, uh, the the matching rate go back retroactive through the entire election cycle, even if the contribution limit was not reduced. With regards to uh, your concern about people uh, raising funds and uh, getting a public grant and then being not m gaining ballot access, this legislation seeks to allow candidates to use public funds to defend a challenge to being on the ballot. Uh, do you think that that would help keep people on the ballot? Do you believe that that might reduce the number of candidates who might otherwise have to pay back public funds? And uh, given the number of, do you, do you actually have a number of the number of people who get knocked off the ballot every, uh, how many participating candidates or people who intended to participate get knocked off the ballot? and? Do you think that it should only apply to defending people who are on the ballot, or could it also be used by a campaign to get on the ballot? Well, <laughs> that's a lot of questions to parse so, out. So, okay, um, so let, let me just, yeah. so I, I know that the chair of this committee is actually in favor of letting people pay a fee uh, in order to gain ballot access without having to do signatures or without having to make public matching, which is another one of my bills. Uh, but in, in a universe where, I, and if he wants to do that bill, that might be a good bill, um, at least for these purposes. But um, ballot access is a problem. And we can't have competitive elections if people can't even get on the ballot to begin with. Well, so the, so what you, the proposal to allow that uh, 
to change that uh, to allow the defense of ballot petitions would assist in the issue that I raised about having people have uh, you make have a sufficient qualified expenditures. Of course, there are other qualified expenditures that other things that are not qualified expenditures that are common in campaigns like uh, paying family members and such. So, but it does help that. I don't think that uh, the, what we're concerned about, and um, this is a different issue, is the concern about paying people before the ballot. Right now, before the, I guess, before the charter was changed, uh, payments were only made uh, bef after the ballot was set, except for small seed grants that would be made in June. That was the legislation that was passed, sponsored by you um, in 2016, <laughs> and uh, and so once now that now uh, what the charter vision did was allow payments to be made before the ballot is set, but require candidates who wanted to get any money at all to file a certified statement of need to show that they had a serious opponent, um, and this bill takes away that uh, that showing that to get any money, you'd still be have to file a certified statement of need in order to get more than 25%, but you would have, uh, you would, you'd be able to get some money. Um, I guess th there's a lot of different reasons people don't run for office. So, I mean, sometimes it's because you were knocked off the ballot, which actually because of a charter change in 2010 is less common because it, uh, that significantly lowered the number of signatures that candidates for city office were required to get to be on the ballot. So there is, it is significantly easier than it had been in the past. I'm not saying that it's easy, but it is easier than it was in the past. I, rem I remember a candidate who was running for citywide. It was, I think, public advocate. I'm, I'm not, sh and his name was Bill de Blasio, and I think he got knocked off the ballot for at least a week, if I recall. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's for signatures. I mean, the, the, uh, again, there are people who can, I, I mean, yes, this does definitely happens. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen at all. And I think that definitely having the, being able to defend and have those be qualified would ha would help with the qualified expenditure deficit issue. Uh, but on the other hand, there is, you know, a big risk giving a candidate who, before they have shown either that they have significant opposition or, you know, serious opposition or have m demonstrated that they've made it onto the ballot, giving them the full public, you know, matching maximum, which would be, um, I think, around $100,000 for city council. Uh, you've raised concern about uh, campaigns are currently paying uh, family members. Uh, I, I think that that should not be the case. Uh, and I guess how, how difficult would you find, and, and I think one of the criticisms that has been brought about campaign finance in general, and I think even by one of my colleagues' predecessors, uh, was a concern that folks might run simply so that they could enrich themselves, their families, and their friends. Uh, it seems like if folks knew that any money that they might pay a family member or friend might get clawed back, or they'd actually end up having to pay it, that might be a, a incentive for only serious candidates to run less somebody end up taking public money and being personally <coughs> liable? Um, well, the, so it's, it's the prohibition for qualified only applies to family members, so it is only a certain set of your actual family uh, that you can't pay with public money. And, um, but there are uh, also other protections to make sure that, you know, you're documented. So with this full match, candidates would have to document more of their expenditures, even down to very, very small dollar amounts because, you know, as you know, in a campaign, people, there are some things that are big, <laughs> expensive things and some things that are very small, you know, and that those are harder to document, uh, harder to, uh, to keep track of. Uh, so, you know, we, of course, our candidate services uh, staff would be there to help candidates figure out how to document those expenditures. Uh, but again, it does put some more pressure on documenting qualified expenditures and perhaps having people have more qualified expenditure deficits than in the past. I want to thank the chair for giving me so many, so much time. I'm going to ask two questions and then let other folks jump in. I, I know other folks definitely have questions. Uh, what is your, what was the cost 
to the whole public grant program in 2013. Uh, if you happen to know the cost in 2017, and what would you estimate the cost be for the next uh, for the next eight year cycle, uh, and uh, what would the difference be in terms of cost between the original 55 percent and the proposed of 89.9 percent? So th this is a hard number to get. So. Not the, so in 2013, uh, we paid out about $38 million in public funds. 38.2 to be exact. Yes. <laughs> um, so if we took, it's the easiest model, and so I'm going to use this model because predicting the future is a little more tricky. So predicting what would happen in 2021. So what we did was we just applied both the 75% cap to the amount that we paid in 2013, you know, based it on the same claims and the model, the model that's proposed, 89%. So we paid about $38 million in 2013. Under the 75% cap, the payments would be about $55 million. And with the 89% cap, it would be about $61.5 million. So I that's the difference between- I got between 61.7 uh, for. Okay, well, so- Close so enough. Ver Round very much error. so, okay. <laughs> uh, and then another question, I'm not sure if you, you have personal knowledge on this, but do you know how long I've been asking the Campaign Finance Board to support a full public match? There's somebody in the audience who might know. I, I imagine, you know, I, I believe that maybe the first time I ever met you, Council Member Kyle, as you brought this up, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure how long ago that was, but it's, it's been a long time. I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, you've been at this a long time, too, so I think it probably 10, I think you said your testimony 10 years, and I wouldn't doubt that figure. Okay, that, that is it for my, uh, sorry, and then I had a question that was uh, submitted by the uh, New York Post via Twitter, I believe, uh, which is they uh, would like to know, do you, do you support this legislation or do you oppose it? It was unclear. So in general, we're supportive of the goals of the legislation. Again, as I mentioned in my testimony, there are some aspects of it that we would like to work, we look forward to working with the council in working out uh, to make it better. That's it for my first round. Thank you to my colleagues and the chair. Thank you so much. Let me just recognize we've been joined by Councilman Rodriguez. Uh, so we'll have Powers, Yeager, and then Rodriguez. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. And I, I want to congratulate my uh, Councilmember Ben Kales, who's been for, for, this, for having this hearing. Uh, he didn't pass the bill yet. But, uh, but we, I stood out there, uh, I think, two years ago when I was running for office with Councilman Kalos talking about issues like this one. And I, his persistence is admirable, and uh, his ability to add sponsors onto this is uh, something that I am jealous of, um, but I, uh, in a good way, in a good way. Um, I want to ask a few questions, and I just wanted to note, uh, you know, um, I have a number of bills on this that I'll mention as well, but we were, we were, um, uh, I have a, a, a so sort of an accompanying bill to this one that would just do a pilot for special elections as a way to try this out before uh, doing it. That was in advance of the charter, uh, the charter changes. I also had a bill uh, earlier, uh, last year, or last year that passed, I was on child care expenses to make those exempt from uh, the CFB limits. And thank you to for, with your staff for working on that. Um, I want to talk just. To, oh, I just want to a, a ask you. You mentioned there are some things you wanted with Councilman Kalos to work on to make changes. Can you just enumerate what those might be? Well, I think it's again working on this issue of when the timing of the payments um, and working perhaps on a solution to the issue of making sure that the payments are going to people who are, you know, are serious candidates and of serious opposition. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I want to ask uh, just some questions related to uh, CFB and, and some, some more related to this. But the first one I have to ask is, with, um, is just more broadly uh, speaking here, which is that now we've seen some deadlines changing around when primaries are happening in New York, in New York, uh, where it's now a June primary. And I was wondering if the CFB had been considering any changes related to deadlines um, with the where the out year and the in year spending limits start, being that you you know essentially a candidate running in the primary has lost three or four months of in year spending 
uh, and whether there's been a consideration of moving those deadlines up. I think you had something here in about February uh, as a deadline and whether uh, in light of some changes around when elections occur, whether there would be some changes or, or, or anticipated or some thoughts around changes to um, how you would handle in-year and out-year spending. So we've been talking about that. I mean, this legislation doesn't, that those deadlines are in the law. Right. Um, so, you know, this legislation doesn't do anything about changing those. That, right. And so, um, you know, again, we'd be happy to look at, you know, proposals to, to amend those. I think that they are, I mean, most of the spending still occurs, you know, in our experience, you know, whether the primary is in September or whether the primary is in June, the, most of the spending occurs in the month or two before the election. So, uh, even though the primary has been moved from September to June, that doesn't really change that fact that most of the spending will be done, you know, in Yeah, I, I actually May was thinking about June. it even the other way, which is that you may have to ramp up your campaign earlier. So you might your out year actually may be affected more than your in year. I agree with you on the in year spending, which is that you're still gonna probably do the bulk of your spending in that that when that's even that smaller window, but that the out year for candidates who need to start getting their campaigns running would be would that would be affected. The so um, the without you know doing an analysis of this, yeah, I, of I mean, so uh, the uh, one of the reasons to have that out year is really just it's kind of a supplement to the primary spending limit. So the, in, the anticipation that's why those numbers are really so small, you know, relative to the uh, to the primary and general election spending limits. They are kind of a supplement to that. So. The, you still have the full primary spending limit and you have less time to spend it. So what the way the law works is that you don't really exceed those out year spending limits. If you go over the amount of them, you're, like you're you're, it, it just mo rolls into the primaries or if you're only in the general election into the general election. So I'm not sure that there's a need to change them because they, again, just are intended to just be a supplement and the vast amount of spending is related to the primary Got it. spending. Oh, yeah, that's fair. That's a fair point. Um, the, um, we were talking about, I just wanted to just take a step back, you know, to, and, and I know this isn't related to the bill particularly, but just, just in general. We just had a public advocates race. I know we're, we're joined by one of the candidates who was in that race. And um, I wanted to just hear any feedback from that race. We had, obviously we had done a law, a law change around to allow, to accommodate candidates' ability to take advantage of that. Um, how many candidates use the new system versus the old system, new being the eight to one, old being the six to one, and any feedback you have from uh, you know, needing to implement the new law or uh, accommodate a very quick and, uh, and citywide race with a lot of candidates? So the vast majority of the candidates chose option A, which is the new program, which Can I- Can you give numbers on that? Um, how many? I, I, I'm gonna, I, I hate, I, since I don't have it written down, I hate to, I think only one of the people, one of the candidates who received public funds, so 11 candidates were paid, only one of those candidates received public funds under the, uh, under the old system. Okay. Um, so that, that I am confident of saying. Uh, whether the, of the 17, there were all other 16 were in the new program, I think that that's not true, but I, I don't know the number. But I've, of the 11 people who were paid, only one was paid under the old system, and I confirmed with my staff who know better. Um, and, uh, but I, so I think that it, it worked. I think that, you know, special elections are kind of a unique animal and that was the first citywide special election that had ever happened under the program. Um, so I think that changing the threshold helped a, a significant amount for, you know, lowering the, having the threshold, which this law would uh, further, uh, for, for citywide special elections definitely helped candidates meet that threshold. Have, short have you thought about any changes since you meant you noted I think 11 candidates out of I think the number was 17 yeah. or make receive public funds a number didn't um, whether the current and it's first time doing this as a citywide so an opportunity to review but whether there are difficulties for candidates in that short time span when a when an election op becomes available uh, or op those seat is open and a special election is called about whether that the thresholds are in the right place to allow can uh, you know as many can you know candidates to have time and ability to get into the into the public funds because that, that seems like a high number who didn't get in. Well, I mean, I think that 
again, I'm going to say that most of the candidates who raised any significant amount of money were able to meet the threshold. Now, the timing was del late because there, it's a very, very compressed time period. So it is true that a number of candidates only met the threshold at the last disclosure statement. We're just in the beginning stages of analyzing what happened in that. Um, again, you know, it was the first one ever. Uh, I do think that lowering the threshold helped. I think that I don't, I'm not sure. I, th I think none of the candidates might have met the threshold under the old uh, law. So the, it, it definitely helped. But I think that there are some changes that can be made, again, in general about how special elections are held and when they're called and how long time the time period people have to run them, in particular for citywide special elections where the 45-day contemplated in the charter is, is quite a short time period. Okay. And um, I just want to ask maybe one or two more questions. One is there also was a um, – the debates that are CFB, I think, sponsored debates. There's criteria to get into those debates. Can you tell us again what the criteria is for um, getting into – like for the, pub, for the public advocates race? What was the criteria for being eligible for one of the debates? Um, the law has that uh, you raise – I think it's 2 percent of the spending limit, raise and spend. Um, in order to be in the debate and that for the first debate and then for the second debate we uh, added some uh, additional for the leading it's the second debate is for the leading contenders so it was a higher monetary the threshold to raise and spend and also that you had to have the endorsement of a, a, a organization of a certain size yeah and for that second one I'm just curious why have that in for the second one I think maybe you're saying it's because for the leading contenders but also if you are a candidate who's you know not an elected official running maybe for the first time you raise the money you've you've been putting your work in and you have to get to or, or you by the way you are an elected official it doesn't have to be you know discriminating against non elected officials but um, you know that that requirement. Can you talk more about why that's included in the? Uh, yeah. um, well, so the debate th threshold is. I, I had occasion to talk at a CLE last week. Um, this is one of the things that's been changed. You know, probably most frequently in the law because it is a. It's a very very hard thing to assess. The one you want to make nonpartisan objective criteria well in advance of the election. And so, so before, so you're not, game, you're not accused, you know, you're not gaming the system for one candidate versus another. Um, one criticism that has been raised in the past is that the criteria are always financial. And so uh, the, the board and the sponsors working together thought that it would be good to have this extra non-financial <laughs> criteria uh, to to show that you're a leading contender, that you were endorsed by a, an organization or endorsed by another elected official. Um, again, I understand that you know that was the thought behind it, and, and it's again we, we revisit this after pretty much every election because because uh, all the every debate, you know, every cycle presents a different difficulty, and so oh, we're always trying to make recommendations and come up with objective, nonpartisan criteria that will let the widest number of people be in at least the first debate, which is what the law contemplates, and then also really uh, set criteria that are appropriate to show the who is the leading contender in any particular race. And again, you do that before you even really know who the candidates are, setting those criteria. And so, um, again, I understand that this happened, and but that was the, obje the objective behind it, was to create a non-financial non uh, demonstration of uh, support. Okay, thank you. And I'll ask my final question, which is um, I have a bill in the, the, which is just sort of to the intention here. So I'm just saying, in, in, with terms of towards the intention of the bill, which is a, one access. I, I have a, I have a few on TFB, but related to issues. But one that um, I think is a recommendation about getting a re required for every borough actually, so that you can't fundraise just from one, two, three, three zip codes. Um, but the other one I wanted to talk about was um, just lower, literally lowering the from ten dollars to five dollars in terms of the amount of what you know what acts as a qualifying contribution. And my quick analysis is that it would help some candidates. It would certainly would make it a little bit easier for candidates to be able to get to that threshold and quicker too, which can be helpful to knowing your you know what your spending can look like and um, plan your campaign out and obviously be able to ask for smaller contributions for you know. 
smaller, smaller contributions. Um, does the CFB have any position on that bill? That actually is one of the recommendations in the, 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 the $5 one. Okay. Uh, it's one of the recommendations in our post-election report. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks to the chair. Fantastic. Uh, Councilman Yeager, followed by Councilman Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to ask you the question that uh, that I asked uh, the previous witness. Uh, if we're if the goal ultimately, and I'm not actually saying that it's CFB's goal because I'm not sure that you were clear that it, it is, but if the goal uh, is to have no private fundraising, why 89 percent and not just go straight to 100? Where uh, and I see Mr. Chairman is ready to go on that. Um, but but my point being that somebody simply walks into the campaign finance board, fills out a form, shows their driver's license, says I'd like to run for mayor, and you write them a check for six million dollars. Got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the goal necessarily is uh, no private fundraising. We we've had a system of small matching, uh, uh, small donor matching, uh, for a long time, and it's worked very well. Uh, People in other jurisdictions have begun to experiment uh, with vouchers uh, where uh, you don't have to uh, do any uh, private fundraising uh, or in other jurisdictions um, there are systems where the full amount uh, of your expenditures is funded by the public fisc. Um, some of those, like the voucher program in Seattle, is very, very new. They've only been through one election cycle and it was a partial election. I think there were only three, three positions that were subject to it. So what I, when I was asked the same question or a similar question by the current Charter Revision Commission, my response is, look, we've got a great system, and it's improving in each cycle. Uh, major changes now with the lowering of the contribution limit, the increasing uh, of the match, uh, the increasing of how much you can uh, finance out of public funds. Let's see how it works. Let's monitor how these other programs uh, are operating. Um, it seemed to me premature uh, to rush to adopt something like a voucher program when we have a good system uh, working in New York, um, but it's something to keep an eye on. Okay. Um, I, I should add that in none of these systems that I'm aware of, whether it's a voucher system or a full public uh, financing program, is it just a question of uh, showing up and saying I'm a candidate for mayor? Uh, even then, there are thresholds that have to be met, sometimes by uh, uh, financial contributions, before you then get your, uh, your uh, so-called full financing. So in any system, you're going to want a threshold uh, to prevent minor or trivial candidates uh, from getting uh, fully financed uh, for their election. So the voters in November uh, decided to take us on this wild ride from 55% to 75%. And here we are five, six months later uh, asking or suggesting that perhaps it would be better to ignore their desire change from 75% than go straight up to about 89. Do you think 75% is better or worse than 89? Should we stay at 75? Should we go to 89? I realize that the board's testimony did not say we want to go to 89, did not say we did not want to go. So if you just want to keep with that, that's okay, but I want to give you another chance at it. Well, we had proposed a, a, a lower limit than 75. The Charter Revision Commission went to 75. We were fine with it. We, we're supportive of the basic idea of having more public funds in the mix. Um, I don't, you know, the, the difference between 75% and 89% to, I mean, I, I don't view this as a wild ride. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small tweak in the way the system works. And our concerns about going to 89, and it's really, you know, we're not expressing adamant opposition. We're simply pointing out the risk uh, in, is that if you go the whole way and you have a system as we do where there are, as Amy has said, certain expenditures which qualify for you, know, you can use your public funds for those expenditures, and then there are other legitimate expenditures that you can't use public funds for. If you went all the way to 89%, our concern is that you're laying a trap for the unwary, that some candidates will not understand and will wind up probably inadvertently, perhaps intentionally, but hopefully inadvertently, 
um, either using public funds for things that they shouldn't be using public funds for or wind up at the end having to give back uh, some public funds. So our idea of not going beyond 75% or not going all the way to 89% is really just a risk factor in trying to create a little cushion, a little gap so that people who, ha who wish to spend le money legitimately but they can't use public funds for that have that cushion. Undoubtedly, if they absolutely understand the law, they can comply with it. Um, but we're concerned that not everybody will understand at that level of detail and that going all the way to 89% creates a risk of some people inadvertently uh, violating the law. Uh, th that's really our only concern in that area. I, I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, that you took the conversation here. This was actually going to be my next question because I wanted to distinguish uh, the difference between things that you simply can't spend money on in a campaign and things that are 100% lawful, however, as a, in essence a prophylactic measure um, and to ensure that our public funds are actually going to buy flyers and, and buttons and real campaign things as opposed to, you know, ancillaries. Uh, we do have certain kinds of expenditures that are not uh, um, uh, appropriate for use of public funds. And for example, uh, it, it wouldn't be illegal for a candidate to use a family member's print shop and pay market and the exact appropriate amount. However, we don't want to encourage that. So as a matter of public policy, we say you can't use tax dollars to do that. There are a lot of expenditures that are perfectly 100% legal. They make sense even, but we just don't want the taxpayers picking up the tab for that because whether it's a good public policy measure, whether it's a prophylactic measure against corruption, or whether it's just, you know, you get that ick factor, it, there's just certain reasons that we have those kinds of expenditures. When you go to too high of a level, and I think this had been the concern perhaps that the board, and I don't want to put thoughts into your minds or words into your mouth, but when you didn't want to go necessarily to 75 straight away, um, you, I think you recognize having seen campaigns struggle over time that when they get that 55% and they have to document and they find that expenditures that they thought were perfectly reasonable, proper, lawful, um, but simply could not be used for tax dollars and then they end up with a deficit in demonstrating qualified public expenditures which ultimately results in a required repayment. So uh, that wasn't the question, that was simply to say that I had the question, I was ready to go, but you took it out of my mouth. Um, I wanna go to- oh, I uh, apologize. No, 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 that's good. That's, 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 that's why I guess they pay you the big bucks. Um, I know, I know. For clarity, the chairman doesn't get paid. I just wanna make sure that that's said. Um, uh, um, and we appreciate his public service, of course. Uh, I, I had a question that I wanted to uh, follow up on Councilman Powers' question regarding the caps and the adjustments, and uh, we recognize the out years, in years, and there are reasons why we kind of add on a little bit in the out year as you build up your campaign. Some spend a little more to build up, some spend a little less to build up, that's the way it is. But we also have an additional problem of that the general election, which had prior here to been two months, is now uh, three extra months, and yet the cap is projected to say the same. I'm not actually even suggesting that perhaps it needs to be increased because it is the exact same cap as the primary cap, but is there an, uh, an intent or a desire, and I know that it's statutory, not regulatory, but is there an intent or desire or a need in your mind to explore perhaps adjusting the general cap? Um, I would say that, you know, the, the caps are set you know, not based on a monthly, you know, I think they're set to kind of reflect what seems to be a reasonable amount to allow cabinets, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to get their message out in a uh, significant way. So I think that, you know, on going with that, that is the theoretical reason for how the expenditure limits are set, that I don't believe the change in the amount of time would necessarily affect that. Well. If you're, perhaps, perhaps if someone's running for city council, that may be the case. Um, you know, all they're really doing is getting their message out. But there are staff costs, um, for example, that now you have people who have to be employed for an extra three months on a campaign that would normally have only taken two months. And I recognize unstated is that most campaigns don't have general elections. I did. Um, other people at this table actually had robust general elections. Uh, and there are members of this body that do, that did have 
general elections. And of course, the mayor's race can from time to time be a robust general election. And that's really where the increase uh, may make a difference because if you are running for mayor, or public advocate controller, you have offices in every borough, sometimes more than one. Um, you're paying high rent if you have an office in Manhattan and now you have an extra three months that all that money that would have otherwise been charged to your primary cap is now being charged to your general cap. It <coughs> may actually um, require you to spend less on your glossy flyers and your TV ads. That act those are actually all very good points, and so I think that's something that we can look at and think okay. about. Yeah. And even perhaps it may, n it may not be for city council that you have to worry about it, but perhaps for the, for the senior offices, mm -hmm. uh, the citywides, and maybe even for the borough presidents, just maybe something to look at. Um, I wanted to, I am getting towards the end of uh, my fund, Mr. Chairman, um, so I appreciate your indulgence. Um, the, uh, the rule in the, uh, uh, the statute had provided, uh, it was adjusted, I believe, several years ago to provide a later certification date and also a kind of get out of, uh, get out of the grips of a CFB date. Um, and uh, because of the, na the nature of the change primary, it's now, there, it's being tied to the primary, so the language being inserted in the statute is the ninth Monday preceding the primary election to have to certify by. And also, you can withdraw from the program by that date. Okay, so that's the premise. And uh, I know this had been a conversation in previous council, uh, sessions of the council, um, about whether or not a candidate ought to be able to get out of the program having not received any public funds um, if it becomes clear that he or she will not receive public funds, let's say in the case of, of a John Liu, Sal Albanese, and some of the f more famous cases where the candidates uh, realized he's not gonna get public funds, but now he's stuck in the program. Um, and there was also a candidate for public advocate uh, uh, who had this issue, and I don't remember, in a different cycle, who I don't remember the person's name, but uh, had this issue where they realized they weren't gonna get the public funds, would have liked to withdraw from the program so that they could put their own money in and honor um, uh, obligations that they made, and then the result, of course, was that they could not do that. Um, is there a reason that once a candidate is in the system and having not received any benefit from the system whatsoever and now realizes that he or she will not get any money from public funds must stay in, that campa in the campaign finance system? Um, the, the goal is <coughs> So that candidates, all the candidates know, you know what system people are running in, you know, so that they know what their opponent, that they've agreed to the spending limit, that you know, plenty of candidates uh, have joined the program with the intention of not getting public funds, but you know, agreed to the spending limit. Uh, so, so that candidates, there's so there's a date certain that all the candidates in the race will know what what program their opponents are running in, what. Uh, obligations they've made, whether they're ob uh, obliged to obey by the spending limit. Um, of course, you know, candidates can continue to try and receive public funds. Part of the idea behind the early public funds payments is so that candidates have more time to uh, resolve any po possible compliance issues or and longer time to uh, qualify to meet the threshold so that they'll know ahead of earlier. So you, you will know, you know, uh, under this bill, December, January, February, March, whether or not you're qualified for public funds, um, and the rescission date is the ninth Monday before the primary, which I, you know, is about it, towards the end of April. Okay, I don't want to conflate the um, the Lou situation with the Sal Albanese situation, but they are very different, and I don't think anybody observing the 2013 mayor's race thought for a second that Sal, though be a wonderful person and a tremendous public servant was going to uh, get anywhere close to exceeding the spending cap. Um, he's not a wealthy guy and, and the money wasn't pouring at him from the donors. Um, but there came a point in time, and he did sign in up for the program because he is a fundamental believer in the system. You know that because you know him for a long time. Um, and the, but there came a point in time when it was very clear he wasn't going to get public funds and he wanted to get out of the program and couldn't get out of the program and then had having already loaned his campaign money uh, in order to meet his obligations, ended up being fined for having exceeded the contribution limit because his loan, out of his own pocket, exceeded what he was allowed to, uh, to contribute to his own campaign. This is not a criticism because that was the law, and, and ultimately when it came to enforcement, the board enforced the law as it was written. However, does that make sense is the question. Um, so one of the other, you know, 
factors in for citywide candidates is that candidates who are participating in the public financing program uh, and who meet the, the objective nonpartisan criteria are required to be included in the debate. So candidates make you know candidates make their decisions about participating or not participating, you know, on a uh, for a variety of factors. And so one of them is for citywide candidates the being included in the uh, public debates that tell being on that tell in those televised debates. Okay, fair enough. Then I'll go to my race because I had no debate, uh, uh, rec no required debate. Um, I ultimately, after having certified, I ultimately ended up with the high spending <coughs> component who exceeded my uh, uh, spending limit by three or more times, and I could not pull myself out. So forget Sal and forget John Liu and forget the nice lady from Staten Island. Um, I have a real life situation of a candidate for city council stuck in a program, could not pull out, maybe would have wanted to, but was held down to an artificially lower spending limit than the opponent who was not in the program and was able to spend two or three or four times as much, but I'm stuck. Well, the spending limit, I mean, there is provisions in the law to increase the spending limit if you're faced with a high spending non-participant. Uh, so either- Didn't, didn't kick in in, these, in this case because, of, because the spending limit was a, enough high, hi, more, an, uh, enough of a multiplier beyond the actual legal limit to, to give a somewhat of a relief, but not to actually remove the cap. It was that, that middle window, yeah. which you, you know, yes, okay, I we know about so. that. Yeah. So, um, and I'm sorry to the audience if we're <laughs> speaking in code, but uh, it happens <laughs> sometimes. Um, uh, there, there need, I believe, and, um, and, and I would encourage you to explore this uh, with Councilman Kalos as you look at this bill, because this bill has this ninth Monday preceding the primary election, and I think there ought to be a way for somebody in a situation where either facts change or the CFB has said you're not going to get public funds or something else, and maybe say, you know, if you didn't get public funds and also haven't participated in a debate yet, because you're right, that is a benefit of joining the program. But maybe there is a way to, um, maybe I shouldn't say get out of the grips of the CFB again, but I think you know my point. It's to let the candidate have the relief so that he or she can go out there and do what he or she thinks is necessary, even if that means putting their own money in. I did not have my own money to put in. I'm not a wealthy person, uh, but it would have given me an, an ability although I did win, it would have given me an ability to, to try to be in a position to go dollar for dollar and continue raising. I just stopped raising money at some point because I knew where my cap was and I was going to stop. Mm -hmm. um, my opponent kept on going because, uh, one of my opponents kept on going because he had the ability to do that. So I don't want to belabor the point, but I would just say that I believe that's something that, that should be explored because it's a problem that we've seen in more than one cycle and not just for mayoral races, um, but for public advocate as I described, and I'm sure this has happened in other city council races as well. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you a question about um, candidates being knocked off the ballot. Okay, so uh, nowhere is being knocked off the ballot at any time the campaign finance board's fault. So this is not accusatory in any way. You're not being blamed for this, but it happens because candidates make these choices and sometimes sua sponte, as in the case of, of uh, uh, now Mayor de Blasio, um, the board will, the, the board of elections will make a decision that uh, on a prima facie basis, the petitions are not valid and the candidate's not on the ballot. And when that happens, after a payment is made, um, you know, the CFB kind of has this conundrum of, you know, we don't give people money so that they can plan to run for office. We give people money so that they can run for office. And if they're no longer on the ballot, they're clearly not running for office. So, um, I, you know, you, you raised concerns about these early payment dates, uh, not just now, but also uh, three years ago when the first early payment date was being discussed. How much of a concern do you believe this is, particularly now uh, as the, the petition filing time is, is March, um, the, pr the primary is June, um, people are going to be getting knocked off the ballot, you know, in the middle of March, I guess, or thereabouts. I think that's the way the calendar works. You have payments that are tied prior there too. And Mr. Chairman is nodding his head because he already knows the question. So what do you, do you see this as a problem? How much money do you think is at stake? Um, you know, are the taxpayers going to be left holding an empty bag? Well, not bags anymore because we don't have bags in this city uh, in two days. But uh, an, empty, an empty box or a potato sack or what, reusable <laughs> something, whatever. That's right. I'm sorry. Um, 
you know, again, I think there, I mean, that's one of the reasons we, you know, the, the Charter Revision Commission had this, you know, requirement that you show that you have a, a serious opponent. Um, you know, that that is one of the concerns, and I, I don't, it's hard to predict how big an issue this would be. Um, again, it, there are provisions in the law that would, you know, if you really didn't run, like if, say, you didn't, if you got the public funds and you didn't file petitions, you know, that there's, you know, provisions about to, you know, get the public, being able to get all that money back that was paid out in public funds. Again, the earlier the payments, the, the greater the risk. Uh, again, it is, you know, there are some ways to put in some uh, safeguards, and uh, we're happy to discuss, you know, some ideas that we have for perhaps you know, limiting those early payments to a smaller amount so that, you know, there's less money at risk. Uh, we, but again, the whole, you know, there's a lot of things at play that we have never experienced before. We've never had, you know, the 75%, we've never had the 89%, we've never had the eight to one, we've never had a primary in June. I mean, so that, you know, again, all of these factors, you know, it's very hard to predict what exactly is gonna happen. Not only was the primary moved to, to June, but the petitioning deadline was is even earlier than it than the relate in relation to the June primary as it was from September. So that does you know help to some extent, but again, it's you know all of these things are new and hard to predict you know until we've gone through an election. I'm wondering if if you might be in a better position than anyone else to to do some kind of wise guesstimate um, because the board uh, obviously prior to certifying someone to get paid has gets the daily reports out of the Board of Elections, who's on, who's off, and if you're able to look at the last cycle, and um, I don't wanna give you homework or anything, but <laughs> I, I'm just thinking about it as you were talking, um, it, to look at who was knocked off and what they would have gotten had they not been knocked off and they were getting an early payment. I'm wondering yeah. if, a, if a simple Kalo style spreadsheet can be just developed <laughs> that, yeah, that I mean, you can I think it's that something out. that we can look at. I mean, I think we have some information, and again, again, I. I one, we can look at what happened in the past and what, you know, if we applied the past, that's, you know, how I, what we, I explained with my, our cost estimates. It's, that's easier to do than to predict what might happen now that there's all these different changes. You know, that's, that is a kind of uh, making predictions from whole cloth, but we could look at what, you know, in the past, how many people were knocked off ballot, you know, that, how much money they would have received, you know, if they had gotten paid two months or, you know, three months before the, uh, uh, the election. Yeah, I really thank yeah, you very well, much. One, one of the uncertainties sure. that can't be known uh, is uh, if someone gets an early payment, how much of that payment have they already spent? Since we've never done this, we have no. Um, it's uncharted water. And, we have and no that's data uh, on which to base an estimate. And I think the concern um, is that, you know, and we've seen this in, in some races, and I don't want to identify who because you, you've seen this, um, uh, you've seen this enough, that a candidate gets a check and and goes on a spending spree, um, really doesn't have a shot to win, um, but they got the check and it's free money. And you know, you kind of wonder whether or not some level of responsibility almost needs to be instilled on them by, by the board. And I'm, guys do a fine job on the audit, there's no question. Um, but in talking about it the, at the payment stage, whether or not there's just giving out this cash well, well before we know that somebody's gonna run is, is something. I know you've, you've been concerned about it for a long time, Madam Director, and yeah. I, I just think it's something that you ought to look at. And I, I mean, and so I, just to answer, I mean, there are, you know, we, the one thing that we are planning administratively is, you know, to adjust the trainings and the advice that we give to candidates to kind of give them some guidance about you know, what are the best ways to spend this early money. To, to, again, to avoid, we don't want people to have to give money back. That's you know, the purpose of the program is to provide the if public If they funds. spend it, they don't have to give it yeah. back. It's gone so forever. And it won't have to be given back because, as you know, uh, uh, if, if a campaign is required to make a repayment of public funds and the bank account is empty, you get zero. Yeah. And that's the empty bag that I'm talking about the mm -hmm. taxpayers holding. Yeah. I, I'll leave it at that because I gobbled up all of the chairman's time. I just want to say one more thing. Um, uh, I know my humor is, and my delivery is sometimes a little drier. Uh, you may have read about that recently. Um, but I do have an enormous amount of respect for the work that the board does. And uh, lest you think this, Jocelyn, is just uh, you know hate, it's really love. Ben and I have a lot of fun with the campaign finance stuff. 
and we very much appreciate the work that you're doing to try to make a better system and uh, notwithstanding that sometimes you have to you know hustle with us a little bit yeah so we appreciate also the very th thoughtful comments and suggestions that you always have to both the administration of the program and changing the law so we're we're equal partners thank you thank you madam director thank you mr chair thank you so much councilmember rodriguez thank you so i'm not going to be asking questions related to my campaign but <laughs> In general, what is there any legal limitation on on limiting the amount of dollars that a candidate can spend if they don't participate in the campaign finance board? No. So this is something that we should be able to regulate if Well, as a matter of constitutional law, the Supreme Court has said we can't. So unless somebody is uh, participating in a publicly funded program, uh, you can't set expenditure limits. So there's, we are not allowed legally to put a limit. No. Yeah. Uh, how do you think that this law, if approved, will impact our 2021 elections? <laughs> I can't answer. This, this, this is one of these questions that, I mean, again, it's like, it's, I mean, I think that, I mean, what we saw from the public advocate special election, the increased amount of matching funds available definitely, uh, you know, it, it probably was a, I, I could guess, was a contributing factor in the, the number of candidates who ran in that election. 2021 is already because of the large number of open seats. Uh, there's an anticipation that there's going to be a, a vast increase in the number of candidates from 2017 and 2013 because of the term limits, the effect of term limits. So. Uh, you know, again, it's going to be hard even even after the 2020 election to make a determination of whether the changes in the law increase the number of candidates or whether the the term limits you know change the number of candidates. But I do think that there'll be a, a, a large number a larger number of people running for office, uh, more competitive elections, and hopefully, I mean, as we saw in the public advocates race, you know, more small dollar contributions. Yeah. What is your a experience we see smart and what changes do you feel uh, based on your experience should be made in order to work better? Well, as you know, I mean, see smart the, which is the software that we provide uh, to all the candidates to make their financial disclosure, uh, we've been over the course of time, I mean, it started as you had to have a disk and now it's web-based and now you can submit your documentation through it. You know, we always are uh, making changes to that software. Uh, after every election, we hold focus groups and do surveys of candidates and campaigns to ask them for suggestions on ways that it could be improved. And certainly this legislation will require us to make some updates to that software because of the changes in the program reflected in this uh, legislation. Can you share like any of those most important changes that you feel will be necessary in order to adapt in case that this law will be approved? Okay, Council Member, could you excuse me for one minute? I have a family matter I have to attend to. I'll be right back. But she can answer the question. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, there uh, there will be uh, changes. I mean, the, the deadlines <laughs> and the filing dates and uh, you know, we're already we're into, we've already for the last election cycle we we just finished adding the submission of expenditure documentation through our software. So you know those kind of those enhancements have already been made, and they'll just need to be tweaks to change the thresholds and the contribution limits and the warnings that are given to candidates. Um, th those are some of the changes that we have planned um, that will be needed both based on the charter revision changes and now this new legislation. Okay. And what about NYC vote contribute? How, what is your experience? I mean, from my end as a candidate, I can say that I saw uh, something very positive in a way of how candidate being able to get uh, that money to, the process was completely much better uh, from, the, from the candidate point of view using an NYC vote contribute. What is your experience from the campaign finance board? So I'm glad to hear that you had a positive experience with that. I mean, that is a, uh, a application that we developed uh, 
for candidates to be able to take credit card contributions to make it easier for them to both solicit and uh, collect credit card contributions and provide the required documentation to ensure that those contributions could be matchable. Uh, we've had an incredibly good experience with that uh, product, uh, a, a wide adoption uh, at all levels of office, so from you know the smallest city council campaign to the biggest uh, mayoral campaign you know, using that software. So. Great. So I'd like to end saying that I hope again that it, first of all, the work that you and the whole leadership of the Campaign Finance Board is doing leading our city nationwide to be one of the best one, having the best Campaign Finance Board uh, system uh, is something that uh, we as, from our role as a council member, are committed to continue supporting. I also hope again that as someone with green car are allowed to contribute uh, in candidates. I hope that one day we also address the issue of no tax action without representations. And as someone with green card who pay the taxes uh, 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 are allowed to contribute, those individuals should also be allowed to elect the local representative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have just a few uh, questions here. Uh, and if you could just give me the short version okay. of it. I know we, I we've Thank been you. at it uh, for a while here. Uh, and we have uh, other people. We have two other uh, witnesses that are going to be uh, testifying. So uh, in your experience conducting audits, uh, what factors most, uh, most often led to candidates not being able to qualify expenditures? Well, I, I mean, I think that one of the, uh, one of the main reasons people have trouble qualifying is that they don't provide the documentation. And some of that, I mean, the way that we, uh, we don't audit, we don't ask for expenditure documentation for right now for every uh, expenditure. The way we do it is we take, uh, we ask candidates to document the largest to the smallest, and so you know, if candidates can document all the money that they've received with the largest contributions, with the largest expenditures, then we don't have to reach those small uh, uh, expenditures. Uh, so I think it's actually just one of the most common, and again, this is a hard thing to parse out, is, uh, is just failure to have documentation coupled with things that are legitimate, as we talked about, legitimate expenditures, but that are just not for qualified purposes. Mm. Uh, what are the most common types of expenditures that candidates fail to document sufficiently to receive public fund? I, mean, I guess that's related to the previous question. Has the CFB considered policies to make it easier for candidates to document this type of expenditures? So yes, we have begun, you know, with the, the introduction of this bill, we've been talking about ways to look at uh, making it easier to document expenditures, in particular small expenditures where it's hard to keep that documentation. Uh, so that, you know, we've been looking at ways that can, to, make, to ease that burden because now candidates will have to document so many more expenditures, you know, even very, very small ones. So we're trying to explore ways to ease the documentation burdens. And you anticipate those will be uh, put into uh uh, procedures for 2021 or we well yes that would be for we would make those changes for the 2021 election okay great I know you talked a little bit about this but if you could uh, again it doesn't have to be long but specific how common are petition defenses expenditures and are you able to estimate an average cost to campaigns for petition defense um, because of the way that documentation the way that these are reported and so they're generally reported as petitions so this would you know so what the numbers I'm going to give are the total amount spent for petitions so that could include the people that you pay to collect your petitions as well as challenge or defend you know with hiring of lawyers so there there are a large number of expenditures uh, for city council in 2013 there was about $411,000 spent on uh, petitions, which is very small in the <laughs> realm of how much money was spent. In uh, 2017, it was about 350000 mm, That's interesting. Uh, for city council spending on 
conditions. And that's the kind of play, the whole, you know, not just defending. I'm glad you share that number. I expected more. Um, no, I, I guess people are counting in volunteers. Yeah, and, and I guess, yeah, I mean, I think people, uh, again, I mean, for citywide offices, it's much more. I mean, for a citywide in 2013, it was almost it was $550,000. But the, uh, again, because of the changes, the charter changes in 2010 that made, reduce the number of petition signatures required, um, just my, this is just completely unapparent. Our statistician would be so mad at me for <laughs> doing this. Just like my my perception is that there have been many fewer petition challenges okay. you know, since that change in the law. Do you think, uh, in your opinion, um, or do you have an opinion regarding, uh, you know, in some states, uh, people pay, and this goes along to Council Mary Yeager's uh, questioning, uh, in some states, you just pay, you know, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. You don't have to collect petitions. Uh, w if that was the case here, would that help the CFP? Uh, would that help with the timeline uh, in terms of giving out funds? Um, well, I, again, I know that there are a lot of people have a lot of uh, debate about the about the about doing that, you know, right. making people pay. So yeah, I'm the not, merits I'm not gonna, is a, I'm not yeah. going to comment I'm on that. I'm not going to put you in that spot. <laughs> but, but, regarding um, the merits. But, uh, I just you know, wondering if, if the if effect you, that we'll have in paid, CFP. You know, if you, if you didn't have to file petitions and instead you paid, say, $1,000 to right. get on the ballot um, and you received your public funds early and then you had the th you would have the $1,000 to pay, so I guess that would make that concern, would vastly mitigate that concern because you just paid the $1,000, you'd have the $1,000 because you got the public funds, and you'd be on the ballot. Do you see a uh, potential for abuse? And since it's only a thousand dollars, then we'll be getting, you know, the person will be getting uh, the, the matching. You know, some of the concerns that were mentioned before. Since it's a lot easier, do you think that? I mean, it's still candidates would have to raise the th the threshold to receive public funds, which is true a part of a you know, to demonstrate that you have significant support within your community, so you would still have to meet the threshold gotcha. uh, to get the public funds. Uh, and uh, Council Member Kalos uh, was asking uh, questions related to this question I'm about to ask. Are there any other types of expenditure that public money cannot currently be spent on that you believe should be qualified for the use of public money? No, I think that you know all the all the items that are enumerated as n not qualified. I think have good public policy reasons behind them to not be qualified. Okay, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much uh, for your work, your leadership. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There's another question before I do this closing. Just one. Uh, okay, well I'm gonna second round. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Mr. Caleb. With regard to the uh, question of the debates, I, uh, I had a uh, odd question. So I think every candidate in their mind believes that they will say something so brilliant that it will go viral and propel their candidacy into the stratosphere. Uh, in the special election for public advocate, were there any candidates who did not qualify for the debates but outperformed candidates who did yes uh, can you can you elaborate and can you share I guess whether whether it does that what what are the conclusions to draw here is that that the debates are less important than we thought they were or that we need to look at other measures to capture credible candidates or a little bit of both what is what is the conclusion at least that CFB is drawing so I mean I, again it is, I, let me clarify, there's, there are, what the candidates I was thinking of were people who were not in the second debate, but they were certainly in the first debate. So, uh, you know, so whether or not that, the being in the first debate helped their, uh, their performance is hard to judge. Uh, it is, again, one of the hardest things to decide because one, you don't really know how much, mo when you're setting those criteria, you don't know 
how much money people are going to raise or spend, or you don't, you're, you're not thinking about that. You're not thinking about the actual candidates. You're thinking about what makes a rational sense as an objective criteria. And then again, of course, you really don't know what the vote totals are going to be. So, uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, now hindsight it's 2020 and I can look and say, oh, maybe there should have been something different, you know, a different criteria. I, you know, we have spent a lot of time thinking about what could be non-monetary uh, criteria that are objective and nonpartisan to uh, uh, be qualifications to be in the debates. I think that if, you know, people could, if there are those, if people, if you have an idea that, you know, what certainly we were looking here, we spent a lot of time on the staff level discussing that and trying to come up with uh, those kinds of criteria. Along the lines of uh, assigning homework, one of the questions that I had is just looking at, and, and uh, my, my, my colleague is correct, Mr. Yeager, that uh, it, is, it is something that I would do, but I'm asking if you could please do it so I don't have to, which is just, could, could the CFB go through the expenditures and try to classify them for us so that we can see how, how many expenditures really wouldn't be a qualified expenditure and, and how real a threat that really is so we can really take a look at the numbers and past performance? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've started to do that and we just, you know, there wasn't really enough time before this hearing to, to get that, all that information, but we can get our best estimate. I, I would just say that um, something for consideration is I think my, my largest expenditure when I ran in 20, Thirteen and again in 2017, after mailers was probably ballot access, and that is because even if you're not defending, you're still hiring one of a cottage industry of between f I'd say a dozen or so election lawyers, and they're and you're going to pay them to go through your your petitions, make sure that the question that they are spotting anything that could possibly be wrong, a comma's missing here, uh, this person wasn't, uh, th there are any number of, I'd say, a 20 or so objections that can be raised, and so these people are actually going through meticulously to ensure that uh, anything that can be corrected is corrected and that a campaign has a very real count because uh, people do, do get knocked off the ballot. Uh, I, I had a question for your chair. Um, I, I guess I will just point out that I guess one of the things that I found interesting about the public advocates race is it still looked like a, a standard campaign. Changing to 75% did not appear to break the system. Uh, you had 27 or 28 candidates. Then I believe it dropped down to 17 that made the ballot. And then of the 17, you had 11 that received public matching. And so you, you had a field that narrowed, and then you had candidates that emerged, and you had candidates that did fairly well. And I guess, is, is that a good thing? I know one of my colleagues was asking about, well, should there be more? So I guess, is there an outcome that appears more competitive than not? Is the current pattern that we're used to, is that the right level of competitiveness? And I guess the second piece, because I don't want to go on too long, is right now as a candidate, I'm used to an election cycle where we petition in June, people go on vacation, they come back, and then all, all of the money gets spent right after Labor Day. And then people get buried in, uh, in communications, they get their voter guide, but everything happens in a narrow 10 week, 10 day to two week window. Moving to a June election, it seems like it might actually be a better thing if we actually saw a six month campaign or a three month campaign or even a 45-day campaign like we saw in the public advocates race of just like having something that is longer where, can't, where, where voters can actually learn more and gain more information. So I guess, is there benefit to more communications over a longer period or is it preferred to just do that blitz at the very end when you're sure everyone's on the ballot? So, I mean, I think that, you know, we have been overall supportive of the early payments. It's just, you know, we have some, you know, concerns about the amounts. And so I, I think it was I, your you idea know, from your yeah, 2013 Yeah, so from our 2013, report. I mean, we, we made the recommendation. So, again, it is definitely, you know, so I, I think that I'm not, I don't want anyone to leave with the impression that we are not, that we don't think that there should be early payments. I think there are a lot of value to those. Um, but, again, it's, I think we're, as I said, 
it's we're in a place where we're not sure. I mean, so so many things are going to change that it's going to be hard to know. I mean, I think you're right. I think that moving to a June primary because you don't have that summer vacation <laughs> in the middle, it may it may make some significant changes in the way people campaign. Again, it is hard to predict. Um, I, I do think that uh, with the public advocate race, I mean, that, that 11 candidates receiving public funds in a citywide race was the most candidates that have received public funds in a single citywide race ever. So, I mean, there is, you know, definitely there's some, with some significance to the changes in the law in people getting the public funds. Really final question, just back to the numbers. In 2013, it was $38.2 million, highest ever. Uh, what was the, no how much did you pay out in public funds in 2017? Um, I mean, I'm not. Uh, I believe it is 17. It's point 17 million. You, uh, you have, I'd have to look it up, but it's it around 17 million was good. 17.7. Uh, and so I guess as we try to figure out exactly how much this might cost over an eight year cycle, 38 million plus 17 million, so you have the peak and then you have the off peak as it were because there's fewer uh, competitive elections when people run for re-election, uh, that, that ended up coming out to about 55.9 million, which is 6.9875 million uh, a year when you annualize it out over eight years. Uh, so I guess, um, do you have an estimate for how much it would cost in off years versus on year? So on year, we agreed that it was uh, 61, you said 61.5, I said 61.7. <laughs> uh, it may be that I've been sitting here a long time, but I am having a hard time following all of those numbers. a lot of numbers. But, um, uh, <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, I mean, we can try and, and I, I, I see what you're trying to get at. I, and I so we are trying, I think we can, uh, do that kind of analysis and provide okay. it to you. I, I would, I think it'd probably not be a great idea for me to try and take those it's numbers okay. so and figure out an annualized cost uh, at this moment. If I extrapolated the number you created for 20, uh, 7, 2013, where we both agreed at 61.5, that's $23 million more. In 2017, based on the same analysis, it would be 10.9 million more, which would be 34.4 million over eight years. and a annual cost of $4.3 million to reduce big money in politics. Thank you, that's my question, over to. No way that was a question. <laughs> um, but that, that, Madam Director, is why I always ask Mr. Kalos to prepare the spreadsheets. Um, I just, uh, I, I had a thought as Mr. Chairman was speaking and, and talking about the petition, the ballot access uh, uh, and expenses to challenge or defend uh, ballot access. And one thought I had was that um, and I don't, I don't know if people take advantage of this, but there is the ability to exempt certain expenditures related to defending uh, the validity of your petitions. Do you see what those numbers are? Are you able to tell us that? Or, I mean, you may not have it offhand, but we can't see it publicly because it's not really, it's not really uh, marked off that way on your website. Is there a way to know based on whether or not people are exempting uh, defense. Yeah, that's one of the things. I mean, that we just we're, we'll try okay. and uh, as, as we try and parse down the numbers for you. One of the ways we'll try and do that. So okay. thank you for that suggestion. But that thank is you. yes. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Madam Director, Mr. Chair. Hope everything's okay. Um, and then one last thought, uh, uh, Mr. Kalos. O all I heard was more. I know it was a lot of numbers, but I kept on just hearing more, more, more. So I didn't hear less. And as those who have watched me here for the last 15 months, I'm interested in hearing less money spent, not more money spent. And I recognize that the, there is a goal here, um, uh, but you know, it's, it, there's a constant of spending more, spending more, spending more, for very laudable goals sometimes, uh, but I never, he, you know, you never see us sitting at this table or any of these other rooms saying, hey, let's figure out a way to spend a little less this year on something. Um, and when we were having this debate about the bill in January uh, to increase the, the cost for the public advocate race, I don't think uh, the people of New York would have gotten a different result um, if if uh, the option A, option B thing didn't exist and we would have kept to the standard 2021 rules as the voters anticipated in November when they voted for the charter revision because they gave us the rules and required us to keep it straight through. So that's my closing thought, but you're gonna come back at me. No, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I, I would say, based on what I read in the New York Post today, where they questioned somebody receiving $30 million over valuation, 
uh, from the real estate industry without a public matching system at 75% or hopefully a full public matching system. You can't elect a candidates without real estate money. And I think that uh, while you heard more and more and more, it will certainly be less than uh, any possible losses from not getting our money's worth on deals. Okay, and with that, <laughs> I want to thank you again. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, looking forward, getting some of those numbers that you were mentioning yeah. that you bring back. And we felt the same. Once <laughs> after a while, the numbers that all started sound, yeah. sound the same. But thank you again. Thank you. Really appreciate thank your you testimony. For Fantastic. I want to thank those who have been waiting. Uh, Don Smalls, uh, which he was a candidate uh, for public advocate, if you could come, uh, please. And Tom Speaker uh, from uh, Reinvent Albany. Looking forward uh, to hearing from both of you. Uh, and, uh, please, please check out the recommendation. Yes, and we received testimony for the record uh, from the New York Immigration Coalition. You can begin whenever you're ready. And thank again, you. thank you for your patience. I no, know you've been waiting for two for hours. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Dawn Smalls, and I am a partner at the law firm of Boyce Schiller Flexner. I was also earlier this year a candidate for public advocate in the special election for that office on February 26th. I ran as a first-time candidate, but one with over two decades of experience in law, government, politics, and philanthropy. Although I have worked on campaign finance reform throughout my career, as a first-time candidate, I experienced directly and personally how critical the public match is to allowing new participants to our political system to effectively compete. I believe the public financing of elections plays two important roles. One, it significantly reduces the importance of existing donor relationships and money in politics. And two, it evens the playing field for outsider candidates and existing elected officials because the match is significant enough that current elected officials have the incentive to participate creating one system for all candidates. That has huge benefits as it forces candidates to participate in a system by which the council and indirectly the voters dictate the terms by which candidates engage and finance their elections. That's an important and big step. The lower limit is crucial as it limits the ability of a small number of people to have an outsized role in the election. This is of particular value where there is deep and widespread concern about the role and influence of special interests, such as the real estate industry, on our elected officials and their decision making. The number of contributors requirement is also important as it makes the $10 contribution as significant as the $1,000 contribution as the focus is on the number of New York City residents that support and are willing to invest in your campaign versus the amount of the contribution. The match requirements are also a persuasive reason to contribute to a campaign as a real and active means of determining which candidates get funded and by how much. However, there are ongoing barriers to outsider candidates running and effectively competing as participants in the public financing system that we must address to meet the council's goals of a, for a more equal and fair system. The first is the CFB's complex and confusing compliance and documentation requirements for contributions. Understanding that taxpayer monies are a limited and precious resource, the current bases for non-payment are extensive, and many can candidates would say excessive. I and other candidates had to devote considerable time and resources to respond to the documentation request from the CFB in a time frame that we could still qualify or receive public funds. I had a considerable infrastructure set up to respond to CFB requests. Specifically, my treasurer, Nancy Human, a senior management professional experienced in city politics, Chris Dragatakis, former CFB staff that helped review my contributions as a consultant, a compliance director, and a finance director. 
At one point, to deal with the requested documentation from my contributors, I had my entire field staff diverted from voter outreach to calling and tracking down contributors to obtain additional documentation required by the CFB. This is an unnecessary burden on all candidates, but one that falls excessively on candidates that may be new to the process and have less infrastructure. However, I would be remiss if I did not mention that the CFB trainings, and specifically Suprita Dada, our candidate services liaison, was excellent and did everything she could to help us navigate the CFB's relatively Byzantine and confusing requirements. The requirements imposed by the CFB to determine who can participate in the official televised debates are also worth mention. The requirement for the first debate in the public advocates race was that each candidate have spent a certain amount in privately raised non-public funds. This requirement is without, without regard to whether the candidate has qualified for and is receiving public funds, which can, can have the perverse result of excluding candidates who have met the requirements for public financing and are receiving public money from the debates. The CFB's requirement for a political endorsement imposed for the second debate is also significant, a significant barrier to candidates running for office for the first time and who may run outside of the political cl clubs that often sponsor and promote candidates. In sum, I believe the referendum passed in November and the implementation of the new campaign finance system is an important step to reducing the role of money in politics. However, I believe more work needs to be done to ensure that outsider candidates can run in local elections and effectively compete. Democracy requires it. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera. My name is Tom Speaker, and I'm a policy analyst at reInvent Albany. Uh, reInvent Albany is a watchdog organization that advocates for open and accountable government in New York. Uh, reInvent Albany strongly supports Introduction 732A, which is a step forward for empowering small donors in New York City. Though New York City's public financing program is a national model, we still think that there is room for improvement because the numbers show that large donors have still provided the majority of campaign funds in recent elections. So raising the cap to 88.8% from 75%, as this bill proposes, would bring the bill closer to a full public match and allow small donors to have a greater voice. Um, we think that small donors have been playing an increasingly significant role in elections. The Campaign Finance Board 2017 post-election report found that 11% um, more individual contributions came from small donors in 2017 than they had in 2013. The recent special election for a public advocate was the first in which candidates could, it could uh, receive an eight to one match with a 75% uh, cent cap with, um, as far as campaign expenditures covered by the city goes. So that, um, even though that was a small sample, we think the results are promising. Um, the, most con the most common contribution in the race, as noted earlier, was $10, even though it had been uh, $100 in previous elections. Um, we also have seen numerous candidates announce that going forward, they will not take donations above certain amounts, like $250, for example. And we think that these are the types of can campaigns that uh, might not have been viable before um, that will benefit from the system. And we think that empowering small donors is uh, the goal of New York City's campaign finance program, and we think that raising the cap would help meet that goal. Um, so this legislation will most significantly impact city council races wherein candidates frequently reach the public match cap. Um, last year, reInvent Albany and Represent Us New York con conducted an analysis of city council members' campaign donations in the 2017 elections. Um, even when at the time donations were matched six to one with the 55% cap, we still found that 54% of uh, council members' funds were from donations over $1,000 and 88% from donations over 175. So under the new system, the cap and the matching ratio have risen, but to reach 25% of their spending limit, city council members will still have to raise $47,500 from private funds. And to meet those targets, even with lower donation limits, candidates will likely have to turn to wealthy donors who can fill the gap most quickly. Um, so raising the cap can reduce that dependency and allow for more donations from small donors. Um, given the trend towards small donors, we believe this legislation will positively impact citywide races as well. An October 2018 report by the Independent Budget Office suggested that the current system advantages established candidates. 
And the Campaign Finance Board and some others have raised concerns that a higher cap could possibly boost incumbents' advantage. Uh, we disagree that this bill would overly benefit candidates that have already um, well-established funding networks. Um, it is true that today only one candidate for mayoral office, to my knowledge, Christine Quinn, has reached the cap, uh, the public match cap for citywide, um, for mayoral elections anyway. But as mentioned earlier, there's more and more candidates resolving to run in small donations, and we think that this time their campaigns would benefit from a higher share of public contributions. Uh, it's clear that New York City voters are widely supportive of measures like this, as evidenced by the passage of question one in November and the 33 co-sponsors on this bill, but there re remains room for improvement in the system, and taxpayers continue to be concerned about pay to play in local government. That's why we support introduction 732A and urge to quick passage. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify and welcome any questions you might have. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Uh, and you know, in the last two hours, I know you, you were both here. Is there anything, any red flags regarding anything that was mentioned by CFB or by council members or anything that you saw beyond your testimony today that we can improve? A lot was discussed. I'm yes. trying to. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, um, I will defer. Is there anything this, specific that you would like? No, to ask I mean that's what I'm looking for for specifics or anything that I mean. I thought CFB did a great job in in answering our questions today. I'm just wondering. I, I tend to ask that question in case mm -hmm. there is a value. Uh, you know, both of your opinions, if you have anything else that you see that can make, uh, you know, that will help the system work better. I know you just went through a race uh, yourself. And I did. I know the pressures that you go through. And if not, I, I mean to ask you, you said the second debate. Can you be a little bit more specific? Sure. Uh -huh. And you mentioned that, were you able to be in the debate? I was, okay. um, but I it was unclear that I was going to be able to make the requirements. When of the did you know debate. that you were going to be in the debate? I think the Friday before, so maybe three or four days before the debate, and um, you know the requirements. Um, did anybody got to know before that? What's the earlier somebody could have no, known? No, we all received official letters, okay. um, and I think it was the Friday before, maybe the Tuesday or the Wednesday. But I do think uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting um, in the testimony was that the requirements for the debate were made um, long in advance. And um, uh, I have no reason to believe that that's not true, but it wasn't communicated to the candidates um, until shortly before each debate. So after debate one, I, I think maybe early January, we got the requirements for both debates. Was so there a training that CFP provided uh, for your treasurer and for yourself? Yes. For this particular race? Or yes. was it a general one for? There was a general one uh, before the official race was called in January. And okay. a lot of people signed up for that in November and December. Um, and, and then there was another training that I think was actually required um, for either the candidate or the treasurer once the race was called for specific to the public advocates race. But specifics, I'm assuming specifics were not mentioned regarding the debates as to the requirement during the training? I don't believe so. We didn't know the requirements for the debate until it was either posted on the website or there was an official letter sent. Okay. Um, and uh, just when you look at how that uh, played out in terms of who actually made the debates, you had people, you know, I just, as, as, a, uh, as a voter, as a citizen, I couldn't believe there could be a scenario where somebody was getting taxpayer money, but voters wouldn't get to see them in an official debate. Mm. I mean, that's just, uh, I mean, th that is a crazy result. And that is how the CFB rules are currently structured that it was, you know, there was one candidate uh, that had raised a lot of private money but had not made the match um, that was participating in both the debates and there were candidates that made the match that didn't get in the second debate. So, um, you it's know, I understand when you, you talk about this in the abstract, um, 
you know, you, you need to understand how uh, these things actually practice out in reality because just as a taxpayer and a voter, um, if I'm paying for somebody to run, uh, those people should be made available um, for voters um, to see and hear from just as a return on their money. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos, Councilmember Brock, followed by Councilmember Yeager. I will start with a huge thank you uh, to reinvent Albany and represent us. Uh, I, it, it is you and your advocates and your members who have been calling members, which is how we got to uh, 33 uh, slash 34 sponsors. The public advocate no longer counts. Uh, he does not get to vote in the body anymore, though he does get to. So. Um, would reinvent Albany and represent us, commit to helping us get to 34, so we have a veto-proof majority on the bill? Uh, I can't commit to anything at this moment. Well, I'll bring it up with them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of this, uh, have, have you seen greater, uh, your, your name is reinvent Albany, have you seen the same level of success in Albany as you've been seeing here in the city of New York? Um, with regards to public, Financing getting on That's back into correct. the budget. Well, yes. I mean, it was passed off to a commission, as I recall, like in this past session. Uh, what, what does reinvent Albany have an official position on how you feel about it being put to a commission versus just getting done or voting? Uh, on? We, we think that there are a lot of risks inherent in that it's possible that even with the funding that was allotted for public uh, funding, that um, it won't actually end up going into law. Like the commission could possibly decide to rule against putting public funding into the um, state law. So we would have preferred to have a system that was closer to what New York currently has. We would have preferred to have seen that uh, in the budget language, but unfortunately that's not what happened. We'll see what happens with this commission, um, but we are you know, still very supportive generally of uh, public financing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your advocacy. We would not be here without you. Uh, my, I have some questions for uh, Don Smalls. I, I have been, I along with at least 7,000 other New Yorkers have been blown away uh, by your- 16,000. 16,000 was the official vote count for you? Yeah, it was over 16,000. I will double, give me three, sorry, 16,000. Sorry, I was. I that number is emblazoned in my brain. That's why. I, <laughs> I, 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 I sit corrected very gratefully uh, to be so. So I, I think many of us were impressed with your campaign. I, I, I as, as, a, as a father with a daughter, I think your, your daughter may have been uh, similar to the, our mayor, uh, quite the star of your ads. I mm -hmm. saw those ads quite frequently. You ran a campaign. Uh, as an outsider, and uh, you beat multiple sitting members, multiple elected officials, both in the city council and in the assembly, and uh, you performed on par with, I think, three elected officials where your, your proximity is almost statistically uh, not very significant. All of you came in. What, what is the total um, percentage of the vote that you got? I think it was like four and a half. Uh, and so I guess uh, how, how you, you also raised, only two of the candidates raised more public funds than you did. You got $800,000 in public funds, making you one of the third most well-funded campaigns. How, how'd you do it? How, wh what worked? How did, 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 it, did it work? W did what work? Did the, the, did the did getting $800,000 improve your campaign? Yeah, of course. I mean, you cannot, I mean, we all live in New York City, and I mean, you need to be able to effectively communicate to the voters in the city, and there's no way to do that uh, without large amounts of money, either through mail or media. Uh, I raised the third largest amount of private donations, um, but that still was, less than a quarter of a million dollars, and that's not enough to run a citywide race. Um, so I absolutely think the public financing of, uh, the public financing system 
allowed me and others uh, to, uh, you know, communicate with voters and effectively compete in this race. There's been a lot of debate, the conversation today about the uh, debates. Uh, you got to participate in both debates. What was the impact on, in terms of uh, field? Did did you have a measurable result of having participated? Where you, when you talk to voters, were they like, "Oh, I saw you on the debate. That's why I'm voting for you." What was what was the actual impact of the debate if, to the extent you had a measurable impact? I think as a first time candidate. It, it probably was significant because I didn't have anybody that knew who I was um, really before the debates or they got a specific ad or a piece of mail from me. Um, just anecdotally from standing out in front of Stytown or getting off the subway for a number of people that did not end up supporting me, um, they often stop and say, I saw you in the debates. I thought you were really good in the debates. That's probably the most often uh, the most common comment I get from voters um, is about, it's not about an ad, it's about having seen me and being impressed by me in the debates. I, I probably uh, joined many of the people in our city. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and sorry, I, I was looking at the wrong page of the certified election results, uh, so it, it is actually 17,420 uh, votes. There you go. I knew it wasn't 7,000. <laughs> Uh, but that, that actually means that you outperformed even, even more sitting elected officials based on those numbers. Uh, and so in, in terms of the, the budget that you are spending, uh, one of the things we have concern about is uh, qualified expenditures, how much of that $1.2 million, is, sorry, one point, one, one million dollars essentially that you ended up with, would you say went to qualified expenditures such as mail and TV ads and, and what have you, and what else would you have spent that money on? I don't have my budget in front of me, but I can tell you the vast, vast majority of my money was spent on uh, mail and mm -hmm. digital ads. Um, so, you know, you either staff. Do you have any 90% of the, well, I think staff. Staff. Is, staffs counts to, towards it too, right? Right, just, so yeah. staff, staff, mail, counts. digital mm -hmm. ads. Office space office space, I mean, that is uh, the vast majority of my expenditures and where that money went. So you're not worried about having to spend 90% of your money on talking to voters and qualifying? No, no, not at all. Um, and frankly, we ended up with a surplus. I, so we will be returning money back. Wow, thank you. Uh, and then uh, ha Chris Dragatakis happened to be my liaison when I ran in uh, 2013. Uh, did he happen to fix any bikes for anyone on the campaign? <laughs> He's in Boston now, so no. Okay. Uh, I, I, he volunteers fixing bikes, doing the transportation alternatives. Uh, New York City That Century. is his career now. He, he is doing bikes full time, if you didn't know that. Um, but he also happens to have extensive CFB expertise, which I was happy to take advantage of. And, and I guess what I would say is in 2013, and uh, this was actually the subject of extensive conversation during uh, one of my more recent audits, uh, we had been trying to spend as much of the time as you just shared about trying to just get every contribution to count. And I think the advice he had given me as a candidate liaison is like, if it got flagged, move on call the person and beg them if they can get somebody else they know to give that $10 so you can just make that match. But uh, I think in 2013, we had we needed 75 in district and we ended up hitting 160 in district contributions before we, we had 75 in district contributions that didn't get flagged for one reason or another. Um, with NYC votes, we actually makes it a lot easier because if they give on NYC votes, it tends to go through without as many problems. So we did not have that same problem in 2017. But was that similar to what you had where you had more contributions that qualified, but they raised concerns about them? Or how, how many were you able to There fix? were a significant number of contributions that were flagged and not eligible for contribution until we did a significant amount of additional legwork. And I would say 
um, you know, I, I think the threshold was 62,500 in the initial, uh, the initial reporting period, I think we had over $10,000 worth of contributions that were flagged. Mm -hmm. um, and for some candidates, if they didn't have enough of a bench, like if they only had two or $3,000 worth of um, mm -hmm. give, they didn't make the match in that right. first round, which was uh, significant in a compressed time frame because it meant that they didn't really get their money uh, till much later. And just the, my last question, it seemed like you, you had a pretty good suggestion where you noted that there were, several of you, there were several of you, if you look at a specific indicator of if you make the public match, you should be in the system, you should, you should be in the debate, that that might actually be a, a very good test and that if somebody has not made the public match, they should, are you suggesting that if somebody did not make the public match, they should have been excluded from the debate? I believe that if you are taking public money, okay. that you should be part of the official debate. There should be no scenario where taxpayers are paying for you to campaign for an office where you are not part of official debates. And, e even and, and, and I would just add to that, that the match has requirements. There are, it's a two-part threshold. One is that you be able to raise a certain amount of money in small dollar contributions and that you get, uh, I think it was 500 New York City residents to contribute to your campaign. Mm -hmm. So there are already requirements in and of the match. It's just that the debates are now imposing a different set of requirements that aren't in complete alignment with the match. And so you may qualify for the debate, but not the match, or you may qualify for the match and not the debate. I, I appreciate your advocacy. I, I call dibs on submitting this legislative service request, and we may ask you to come back to testify again. That's, my, that's it for my questions. Calman? As I sit here and talk, Can I so just respond? I just yes, thought of ahead, um, yeah, yes. to the chair's earlier question about uh, any commentary I had. Um, I do, as, as the person who is sitting here uh, that ran for public advocate that was not one of the elected officials uh, that ran, I do think it's important to note that some people feel that there is too much focus on raising money um, as the and only barometer um, of whether you make the match or whether you qualify or whatever else. And so I do want to applaud um, the CFB's attempt um, to find some other means of measuring candidates. The only thing I would point out is that in the, the, the version that they have come up with, you still have to raise the money. So it doesn't take the focus away from raising the money. It just adds an added uh, requirement on top of that that really requires that you be part of a, um, part of a political, let's just say family. Uh, you know, somebody to sponsor or endorse you, um, which uh, I, I think is, is an unnecessary and uh, too much of a barrier for somebody that is trying to run outside the system. I said this in my campaign, I believe this. We live in a city with an amazing number of experienced, qualified, talented people, and they should be able to run for office. Um, and uh, serve for some period of time without being part of uh, the local political club system um, or having to work their way through for 15 to 20 years. And so, um, you know, when you talk about uh, the endorsement uh, uh, requirement, which was really only a factor for a small number of people that made the match, but were not running as part of, uh, and was a significant factor for me personally. Um, I understand the intent, but it actually doesn't get to the heart of what I think people's uh, concern is about the current requirements, which is about too much of the focus being on uh, a candidate's ability to raise money, because that requirement is still there. You have to make the match uh, well, it, in the CFB's requirement for the second debate, you still had to have raised a higher amount of money um, in privately raised funds, and you needed that endorsement. Um, so I, I don't think that that, um, that version of what they were trying to do actually accomplished their goals. 
Thank you. Um, I, I share uh, Mr. Kalos' congratulations to you because it, it, you know you did come onto the public scene kind of without that having been having run for something before and run for something before and run for something before. Um, I, I hadn't run for anything before. I ran the first time, um, and neither did uh, Councilman Kalos, I think, and some of the others here. Um, but it, you ran for citywide, so it's a, it's a little bit different. I had a question about your your comment that you made um, about this you know, this period of time where you kind of had to shut down your campaign to put everybody on your team to get the documentation. And I assume you're referring to contribution information. Yes. In order to, it wasn't about expenditures. It no, was okay. it was to get additional documentation. And it was because those had come back with an invalid report that they were not going to be matched? Yes. Are you able to, to categorize the most uh, common uh, invalid claim or invalid uh, uh, code that you your contribution were they credit cards were they checks was it, was it cash without a form what uh, the, the CFB would have that information I will say there well, were they're not they're, they're just to be clear they're not going to tell us something about your campaign so we, we would only know it if you if okay you would, I can tell, tell you tell what us. I know okay. I told you the infrastructure I had in place to deal with this so I, I don't know that I know all of the specific incidences okay. but I can give you a couple of examples sure. um, that both. I, I think, experienced and talked about with other candidates with total exasperation. Um, you know, if you made a contribution, you're married, and you made a contribution from your joint account, I think that would get kicked back, right? Everybody knows it's your account. You're a New York City resident. Check or credit card? I, I don't know. Okay. Um, but it, there was a question about it being very clearly your account, but it being a joint account and there being an issue. A separate issue uh, that my treasurer <laughs> raised with me earlier today because it was a significant one is about uh, uh, contributions being uh, kicked back because they were found in the doing, uh, doing business database, which is important and is something that we need and it shows people that are doing business with the city and make sure that uh, their contributions, they have lower contribution limits uh, to make sure that they are not having an outsized influence um, on the election or policy. However, the doing business database is grossly outdated. And so people who are in that, uh, it could be 10 years old. So I think the example that my treasurer gave was that one of my contributors was on the board of their preschool 10 years ago and then um, was still in the doing b a business database. And then the onus is on the person to get themselves out of the database, right? And you're all dealing with this in a compressed time frame. So we had to return the money. I mean, even though they're not, I mean, there is no conflict. They're no longer doing business uh, with the city. Um, and most people don't know that. I mean, they don't have this sophistication or frankly the time to just say I'm going to get myself out of this database which restricts my contributions um, to candidates in the system. So I think that's a concern to anybody running um, in the public financing system is you, you need that database to be accurate um, and at least re remotely current rather than uh, you know over 10 years out of date. So that was the joint account and doing business database. I think those are the two. How about credit cards? Um, there was a lot of, I mean, I, I, I don't really take issue with this, but there was a lot of um, if your address didn't match. So if it doesn't match with your billing address, so if somebody gave their work address or their home address or they had a different address or whatever it was, even if it was a New York City address, if it did not match exactly the billing address of your uh, credit cards, that was a huge thing. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, a number of years ago, this council, the CFB staff and I will have this disagreement, but this council in a previous session passed a law specifying uh, what kind of information the CFB is required to receive in order for a contribution to be matchable. And when it passed the law, it did not put in to the statute a requirement that the CFB had been uh, enforcing for some time, which is this match of an address. And it was done deliberately, in my estimation, and my estimation is based on fact, uh, that um, uh, that wasn't to you, by the way. That was <laughs> not, it wasn't to you, Mr. Chairman, either. It was right at a, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, that the that it was done intentionally because the council was aware that the CFB had been enforcing this. You know, your the 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 uh, uh, address that's entered in has to match whatever comes back from the billing. Now everybody knows that it's not 1995 anymore. Uh, we're we're not a we're not a paper society where people have their credit card bills coming online. Uh, they may still be billed to their parents' address where they got their credit card the first time when they were in college, and now it's 20 years later, and they haven't bothered changing their address. It happens all the time. Um, but uh, the CFB doesn't require any <coughs> verification of a check. If it just has somebody's name on it, you could the campaign can type in whatever address it wishes, and as long as that's actually a residential address and presumably truthful because campaigns aren't lying, it's going to be matched. So there's this disconnect. And um, I noticed that you were using Act Blue. And Act Blue uh, does the, I checked that now, it's not that I remember your campaign. Um, uh, Act Blue does this verification, but when the CFB gets these reports, they will just simply start knocking your contributions out one by one. This inf piece of information was what I was trying to get from you on what the predominant number of, or, or the predominant category of invalids was because I, I really do believe that the place where there's a disconnect between reality and what the CFB's uh, uh, validation requirements are is at credit cards. It's not at anything else because I do believe, for example, doing business, just to be perfectly clear, um, and it, I'm not an apologist for the CFB in any way, nobody will ever accuse me of do being so, but it's not the CFB's database. It's, it, uh, it, the database comes from data that the city receives, and when people are on a database as having done business, sometimes they're there because the entity that they did business with is still sending in annual reports listing them mm -hmm. as on that entity without the person's knowledge. Yeah. So yes, Mrs. Smith sent her child to a preschool six years ago and was on the board then, never took her name off the board, has mm -hmm. no idea she's still on the board because they don't meet, but she is on the board and she's still listed on the database. So th it's an issue, but it's not a CFB guided issue. Um, but I think that the credit cards is where it's at and I would be very curious to know the percentage of your valids versus invalids on credit cards because I think that that's something that the council really has to figure out a way to help those first time candidates, particularly because now we are going to a, a time when most of what's going to happen by contribution is going to be by credit card. Mm -hmm. And we have to make it easier for people to run and my, my good friend uh, Ben Kalos has many ideas of how to do that, w some of which just require the city to write big fat checks out to people. But I think that there should be some easy way for candidates to go out there because one of the things that I've noticed is that, or I, not I've noticed, it's just the reality, um, candidates when they're getting in for the first time have no idea what the tail end of the CFB looks like uh, after election day. Uh, these, these boxes in your living room are not going away anytime soon. You're gonna be living with the order for the next two years. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, four, okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Kalo says it's four. Um, uh, there has to be an easier way. Most people who run and participate in the campaign finance program and do it because we are trying to open the doors up, like to me, I was a first time candidate, and like to Councilman Kalos and uh, to Chairman, we, we have no idea what happens at the end unless you've actually participated in campaigns before on the mm -hmm. working side of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most people who run lose. Very few people who run and participate in the program win. Most of the people who are in the CFB system are people who did not win an election. And uh, we have to figure out a way, I think, not just to help people win, but to help those who don't win uh, get a chance to run and not have, you know, the foot of government on their neck for the duration. Now, I just also want to say that the things you talked about, the assistance of your of uh, of your liaison, for example, mm -hmm. the training, uh, the the speed by which CFB communicates with you, and those are all the things that are very good about the system. The CFB system is designed to help pe bring people in. But what I wanted to elicit from you in your testimony was where is the Where's the breakdown that has a campaign shutting itself down completely so as to validate contributions, particularly in a special election where the turnaround between the invalid report and the fixed date is literally five, six days? Yeah. And, and that's, not, that's not a place where any candidate in a special election should find themselves, shutting themselves down, and I think that that's what happens. It doesn't happen in primaries because there is enough window, yeah. but in the specials is where it really kicks in. So if you can figure out, you know, 
just send it over to I'm cu really curious to know what that number is percentage wise yeah how many credit cards did you have how many were valid first time how many were invalid the first time I think we can pull that I'd love um, to know I am I am not the expert I don't on think the that system. the CFB is is vehemently opposed to finding a way to fix it I think it's just a matter of no of finding course not. A way to fix it. Um, but I do think you know as I sit here in this hearing you know it's 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 the difference between talking about something in the abstract and then talking about how it works in practice. Yep. And so, um, you know, I think the benefit of my testimony is, uh, you know, the, the, the really, the explanation about how these things that we're talking about in practice, um, you know, actually worked for a first time candidate. I'll, I'll mention that New York City contributes, we were all excited. Um, uh, to use it, I used it as my primary uh, means of soliciting uh, contributions, and it didn't work for me. I mean, I would say 30%, it was a huge issue. Um, wow. It just, I had, I mean, the email traffic I had in my first month of soliciting contributions, I'd say a third of the people just said it won't work. Um, it doesn't work, your site doesn't work, I can't contribute, and some of that money I never got back. Is that why you went on to, 100%. you opened up Act Blue? A hundred percent, about why I moved to Act Blue. I was just losing money. And so, I mean, people contribute at that moment when they, and they would send emails um, to people being like, I tried to contribute to Dawn, but that thing doesn't work. And um, I mean, I have the email traffic and it was one of the most frustrating like I knew that that was the best system, you know, that was the thing that spoke directly to the CFB, but it was just, I was losing money. And so I had to figure out how to make the change over to Act Blue. So I think that's also something important to say, because um, there are definitely, I mean, there are definitely bugs in that system. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted, uh, be, before we conclude, to thank the uh, Campaign Finance Board uh, staff and uh, the board chair, uh, Frederick Schaefer, for staying. Uh, I don't think I've seen a board chair stay before, so thank you. And we really appreciate that. It matters. I uh, want to thank you both, but I have one last question, and that was in regards to Oh, now the question is escaping me. I've been sitting here waiting patiently to say, let me let my colleagues, I oh, know, I was just so entertained by what you had to say. <laughs> oh, here's the question. The question was in regards, do you think there is enough time from the day that it was announced that you could run for public advocate, all these special elections, and I want to reinvent Albany also to, uh, to chime in. You think there's enough time for citywide races to raise enough monies to uh, be able to really get your message out? I, I just feel like the time is so short and the pressure and everything else that you had to do, it, it makes me wonder, uh, does the message get out, d gets out, uh, in, in an efficient, effective way, especially when you have not been, you know, coming in as an elected official. So I'm curious as to both of your opinions regarding that. Do we have enough time? Um, we don't have a specific position regarding that, but we were supportive of moving up the date through which uh, candidates can receive their public match funds um, in regards to question one last year. I mean, it's, we'd probably be open to exploring if there needs to be any further changes. Okay, all right, thank you, appreciate that. 45 days is very tight. Um, there's no way to slice that. Uh, and I don't know why it's written that way. I mean, I think we, I think part of your job as a candidate is to figure out how to get your message out under the conditions and the time frame uh, that you are given, and I think we did a good job of that uh, in the 45 days. 
Um, but that being said, uh, it was a very, very short time frame. And I think we could have benefited um, from additional time. But uh, on the other half, on the other side of that, we packed a lot in. I mean, mm -hmm. there were public advocate forums in different boroughs, sometimes three or four a night. Um, you know, we had the two official debates. Uh, you know, there was lots of news coverage. So, you know, given the fact that uh, many voters don't tune in at all until a couple of months before an election, um, I don't know the answer to that, but I will say as a candidate, 45 days was very tight. Yeah, I can only imagine 45 days and on top of that, you have to, all the places you have to go and then you have to be on the phone, fundraising, and that just, well, not just on the phone. I think this is important because it shifted because of the public financing system. Mm. I did a lot of house parties. I mean, I did a lot mm. of meet and greets That's because good. for me as a new candidate, uh, I wasn't concerned about the dollar amount. I just don't have 500 people that you know are my friends uh, that can give me money. And right. so I had to get my message out to voters um, and get them behind me and my campaign. And, and I was invested in, I had to hit, to hit that threshold. I needed 500 New York City residents to donate to my campaign. And the best way to do that, because they didn't know who I was, was to get in front of them mm -hmm. um, through meet and greets in people's offices, in their living rooms, uh, you know, whatever the setting was. And it was pretty, if somebody found uh, me compelling or found that my message resonated, you know, you could really effectively persuade them to give you $10, mm -hmm. right? And that was as a, a big a hurdle, and that was as a big a goal for me as it was the dollar amount, which I think, uh, you know, really supports the idea um, behind the public financing system um, in the first instance. Well, I have to say, uh, kind of all blessings that you were in Plan A. I ran in 2009, and that was something else. Uh, <laughs> to compare it to what <laughs> you've been spared of, and all the candidates of, uh, I'm running out of adjectives and adverbs, and I'll keep it like that, of all the pain and the pressure. I mean, it's just tough, and also, for all the reasons that have been mentioned today, uh, it, this plan that we have right now, it forces the candidate to go to the average person, mm -hmm. just like you mentioned right now, to be before them. And that intentionality, I think, it makes a world of difference uh, to our constituents. And also, it, better, it makes you a better candidate at the end of the day. And so the, the outside influence, um, that sometimes other groups exerted now is going to be out of the mix. And so so let me close with that. And with that, I want to thank uh, all of the staff. Did a fantastic job to get us prepared here uh, today. And to my colleagues to stay all the way to the very, very end. I salute you both for your very, very uh, wise questions that you were asking and for your testimonies today and for CFB. And with that, we close today's hearing. Thank you so much.